So it's one o'clock, time to start. I hope it works. You can hear me, I guess. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, this is my pleasure to welcome you on the conference memory of the past and politics of the present. You know, when, when drafting an annotation about the planned conference that spring, May, I guess, I wrote that the war would hopefully be a thing of the past by the time the conference takes place. At that time, I really thought it would, but I was tragically mistaken. The insane and criminal aggression is still here, and thousands or perhaps tens of thousands of people have died in the meantime, and unfortunately many other people will undoubtedly die during today and tomorrow in Ukraine. In many respects, the debate about the context and consequences of the war in Ukraine is a sensitive matter. It is obvious whom we sympathize with and who has our support. But today and tomorrow we will have to focus on scientific research rather than a political statement. Under the circumstances, it is certainly difficult to deal with our topic, Sine Era, sine era at Studio, as dictated by the rules of our discipline since time immemorial. But we must try to do so. Moreover, we historians deal with the past and judge topics in which we are interested in a material and time context as a closed matter of the past. Our colleagues, political scientists or sociologists may have a different view because they are more accustomed to dealing with current topics. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine and her allies is sometimes compared to a new Cold War. However, there is a major difference. While actors of the Cold War made use of ideological reasons to justify their positions and actions, the key role in the Russian aggression against Ukraine belongs to arguments relying on an interpretation or rather misinterpretation of history. In this respect, the Kremlin returns to a past even more distant than the Cold War. However, the perspective dealing with how Russia uses historical arguments is not the only perspective which can examine relations of history, historical memory and politics. From the viewpoint of social sciences, the examination of the role or potential role of authentic historical memory in current political decision-making processes may, may be even more interesting than a mere clarification of Russian misinterpretations. It is definitely a more subtle and more diverse matter. And it is the relationship between historical memory and political decision-making processes or a cons consensus appeal of politics to the historical memory of the public, which we will examine and discuss today and tomorrow. We will hopefully contribute to understanding certain aspects of what has been going on in the Ukraine and Russia and in a number of other European countries. As these, are events, as these are events unfolding before our eyes every day, we should also be aware of the responsibility of ourselves and our disciplines toward the public and avoid oversimplified and unilateral judgments and conclusions. I really appreciate your participation and would like to thank you all for coming. I would like especially to thank our partners in organization of the conference. In alphabetical order, they are Centre Francais de Recherche en Sciences Sociales in Prague, Deutsches Historisches Institut in Warsaw, European Network Remembrance in Solidarity, and Stiftung Sächsische Gedenkstätten from Dresden. The event is being held under the auspices of the committee, wrong name, Committee on Education, Science, Culture, Human Rights and Petition, petitions of the Senate of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. Our thanks go to the committee and especially its chair, former president of the Czech Academy of Sciences, Professor Jiří Drahoš. Last but not least, it is necessary to say that the conference is, is being organized within the research program Anatomy of Europe, which is a part of an interdisciplinary ambitious project of Czech Academy of Sciences called Strategy 21. And now I would like 
to ask the representatives of partner organization to say a few words. At the beginning, I have to say that, unfortunately, Markus Pieper, director of the Stiftung Sächsische Gedenkstätten, is not among us because for unexpected and urgent matter, he has to stay in Dresden, but he will join us later. He asked me to uh, say you hello, but he will be with us uh, maybe this, this, uh, this later afternoon, definitely tomorrow morning. So, please, few words. Mateusz Chmurski, director of the CEFRES. As a research center in Prague, we are devoted to all the four Visegrad countries. Uh, Cephas is working since um, a long time uh, in the different manners uh, on the issues present at this conference. It's been in the form of webinars uh, of conference and international conferences, as the one organized in Paris recently. Uh, yet also, we are current, just to let you know, we are currently working on a most more sustainable forms of collaboration and help in the cancer and prison crisis. And I mean by this, uh, the idea of non-residential fellowships for Ukrainian researchers in Prague, organized by this efforts with its privileged partners. We are currently working on this very topic in the weeks to follow, we shall announce uh, a proposal with our privileged Czech and French partners. All in all, I would like to be very brief to enable you to discuss much further later on the idea of rethinking the past to reimagine to re the present, to reimagine the present and rebuild the future um, is absolutely crucial to us and we are honored to be able to contribute to this event. Uh, where memorial stakes are absolutely fundamental to imagine a future different from the present and that we are facing right now. So I'm eager to hear the debates to follow. Thank you so very much for this. Thank you, Mateusz. And now I would ask Miloš Rezník, the director of the German Historical Institute in Warsaw. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, German Historical Institute is one of six uh, similar historical institutes, German historical institutes abroad, the other ones being in, still in Moscow, but also in Rome, London, Paris, and um, and Washington and we have other four institutes, um, similar institute uh, institutes in Tokyo, Beirut, and Istanbul, and one institute for art history in in Paris. There are two institutes in Paris. Uh, all the institutes are par part of, uh, of 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 the, of Max Weber Foundation, which, which is an institution co financed almost completely by the federal. German Federal Ministry of uh, Research and Education. We are a research institute uh, existing since 1993. Some four years, four or five years ago, we established two branch offices of Warsaw Institute in Vilnius and in Prague. Uh, but the main connection to the topic of this conference is our research group that we have, have established since 19, since 2015, I think. And this research group in Warsaw is dealing with functionality of history in postmodern times. We are asking what people, individuals, and, and societies, and, and communities, um, uh, where are they, and, and to what purpose, and in which way they are using, using history. Maybe I will say a little more uh, about that topic in my in my paper in several in a couple of couple of minutes. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> and the next speaker will be Jan Riedel. <clears throat> Jan Riedel will speak as a representative of <clears throat> very important <clears throat> uh, pan-European, so to say, um, organization, European network of remembrance and solidarity. Um, Jan Riedel is not a director of that important organization, but I would say from the very beginning, something like a moving spirit of all their or our activities. So welcome here, Jan, and please you have heard. Thank you very much. Um, dear Olrich Tuma, uh, dear Mr. Jesnik, dear Mr. Chmurski, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor uh, and pleasure to welcome the participants of the memory of the past and politics of the present conference. We are witnessing an extraordinary acceleration of the course of history. Uh, the strategic pause uh, is over, as the military says. Uh, there is a serious correction of the world order and especially the European order. At such a moment, the attention of the politics, of the public opinion, is always somewhat naturally mm, turned to history in order to explain uh, the deeper causes of the, uh, of the drama unfolding before our eyes. The, the significance of which clearly goes beyond the borders of Ukraine. The, Europe, the European uh, Network Remembrance and Solidarity, which I uh, represent here, was established to facilitate dialogue on the uh, border between history and politics at such moments. Although the creators of this network certainly did not imagine that it would operate at a time when a uh, a murderous full-scale war is raging in Europe. So, as you understand, the European network mm, uh, remembrance and solidarity could not but uh, support the initiative of Professor Olgic Tuma and the excellent concept of this conference. Therefore, I would to convey to this eminent historian and author, as well as uh, to all the people and institutions who contributed to the organization of the conference, our sincere thanks and wishes that the act of increasing of knowledge and understanding of history that will uh, take place here will, tout proportion garde, rise the quality of politics. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now, after a very short technical break, we will start with the first session. So I would ask those who are on the program for the first session to join Mateusz Chmurski, who will chair the first session here on the stage. And in five minutes, we will start. Yes. 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 Yes.
sorry, it just. <laughs> Share the first session of this uh, conference. I've got the honor to have the eminent guests um, on my left. Uh, well, I propose that we start immediately without further ado, as we have one hour and a half for four interventions and hopefully a bit of discussion. So I have one crucial demand that you already are aware of of keeping in 15, maximum 20 minutes. Just um, to enable like 10 15 minutes at least of the discussion at the end um, of the first panel. I'll start with presenting briefly um, my um, major interviews. Uh, Professor Milo Szczesnik, that you probably heard a while ago. Um, I would just like to remind you to receive the PhD in general history, working on patriotism and identities in real Prussia in the 18th century, beginning in 1989. Then a postdoctoral qualification, if you like. In general of history at Palatka University, all notes devoted to Polish national uprisings, transformations of elites and collective identities, 1764 to 1994 to 1864. He's been advisor in the Foreign Ministry of the Czech Republic, research associate at Charles University, the University of Technology in Liberec, and um, the famous Center of History and Culture of Eastern Trade Europe, the GVCO in Leipzig. Uh, finally, Professor for European Regional History at Cambridge University of Technology and, uh, as we all know, since 2014, Director of the German Historical Institute in Warsaw. Here, Miloš. The floor is your up. Ah, Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, good afternoon again. <laughs> I try my best to hold my computer here. It's, it's doing. So, dear colleagues, in my statement, I would like to make some consideration of the of the of the problematic of of uh, retrotopic practices uh, in in current uh, policy of history and in current historical thought. What does it What does it mean? Let's start me from an observation with with an observation to the role of history and historiography in uh, late modernity. I suppose you will agree with me that the position of academic historical science is not the same as it uh, as it has been some 50 years ago, and definitely not the same as uh, as it was the case some 100 years ago and and or, or 150 uh, 50 years ago. We are definitely out of histor hist hist historicist. Uh, historicist period, so there is less and less acknowledged, recognized general social relevance of academic historical research. But on the other side, we can observe that history is present more and more everywhere. You can go to to to, to library and show and, 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 and look how many historical books are there we, you can you can look the programs of broadcasting of television with with many of of um, of historical uh, um, of, of, of of historical programs um, um, topics you can look that there is a lot of history in modern postmodern computer games you can you can observe that there is a lot of history in some subcultural scenes like gothic and and so on and so on you can also uh, observe that there is a lot of history in entertainment some authors are speaking of histotainment of of uh, of our days even Travel agencies used history to to, to sell they, what they what they offers. There is a lot of speech of authenticity, of visiting authentic places. Sometimes quite odd combinations. Nowadays, I have seen that there is a offer of travel agencies to visit authentic places, which had to do with. Um, with this story of um, oh. mm. 
It's the name of the hero and, and uh, of, the, of the Rowling. Harry Potter. So, so you can you, you can you can visit the authentic places of, of, of uh, where an uh, where an uh, uh, virtual virtual story took 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 place. This this is uh, only one one example of the changes of our uh, ch changes of our understanding understanding of, of authenticity. One of of of, uh, um, of of, of many possible examples. So, so examples. So, so you can you can uh, observe that uh, our our use of our using of, of history changes uh, changes um, too. Uh, maybe, and that's that's the point for me to to thematize the, the postmodern functionality of history. But uh, because seemingly we are com may, maybe coming back to normality, coming back to to, to aesthetic functions of. Of, 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 of history, not only academic, uh, not only historiography and history as an object, object of um, uh, um, of what in German is called ex Erkenntnis, also uh, um, uh, object of epistemolo epistemologic strategies, but also um, a, a part of 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 aesthetics. And so I could now also quote a Polish, the Polish cultural minister, minister for culture, that said some five years ago, ago, we too want to have a beautiful, beautiful history. It's very, very important, important wording because it, that was made, made in context of what is called in, in Polish historical diplomacy and, and politics of politics of history. So I believe that uh, Beauty of history has impact of our positions today, and you all have also, uh, also experienced scenes in at least in, in 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 the news and in in television with people destroying historical monuments in America, in Great Britain, and at different places several years ago. People. That, want, that, that wanted to do something with, his, with the past, with the tradition, uh, with the heritage of history. What does it mean, retrotopy? Retrotopic practices. Retrotopic practices are practices that are trying to change history or to do, to, to do something with, with history. The, uh, the practices that are based on imagination that history can be influenced by us with our memorial practices. So it, that the, the, the idea that memorial practices and, and, and politics of history can change the, his, as the, the way history appears and, and in the same time to, 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 to change history or to re-establish a moral balance that was destroyed to historical processes. With a notion, with a category of retrotopy or retrotopia, of course, I'm recalling Sigmund Baumann. That was also the title of the last book. I think that was the last one of the books by Sigmund Baumann, uh, 2017. And Sigmund Baumann, uh, the starting point for, for, for his consideration was an observation of soci sociologists and uh, liter literature scientists. So if we look uh, how we in our culture and our, yes, our, in, in our times are considering the future, what, we, what are we expecting from future, we can, we can observe a, a, a general tendency, a, a general negative tendency. So, so we are expecting as majority of people living in Western, Western cultures now, today, and here, expecting less and less positive things and more and more negative, negative things. There are two, two, uh, uh, two um, developments where this tendency is obvious. The first one are the surveys in Western Europe and especially in America. If you ask people in sociologist surveys, do you believe that your children and grandchildren would, will live better, will have more happy life than you had? So still in the 1980s, the, 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 the large majority believed, answered yes, 
our children, our grandchildren, and our grand grandchildren will live will, will live better and better than we have lived or, or that, that we are living. Now this view changed dramatically. The majority of people don't believe that. The majority of people says now now I'm afraid our children grandchildren will will deal large problems and will definitely not have better lives and better circumstances circumstances um, than that we have or we had. So you, 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 you can observe a turn to negative expectation towards history. And if you look at the same times of the development of the genre of science fiction in film and in literature, you can see the same tendency. Science fiction till the 1980s were marked predominantly by positive expectation. The future was something good. The people will be we will develop new technologies, to new, 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 new means of transport, new uh, organized life uh, uh, better and better, and, and the world better and better. So people had positive authors, had predominantly, not, uh, not always, but pre predominantly uh, positive expectations or proposed positive imagination imaginations on the future and that changed dramatically since the 1990s too it's the same it's the same development looking at science fiction films and reading science fiction liter literature today you what 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 could you see negative expectations pessimism darkness or a lot of darkness uh, destroyed a destroyed world dis destroyed social relations the law of the strong of the strong of the strong people and so and and, and so on and that uh, this development is copied is copied for for another de de development in our political discourses please look at political discussions in western countries since the 1980s so you can observe one tendency is the tendency to argue about things that are not so important. So, should there be a speed limit in, on, the, on the motorways in, in Germany? Should there be a tax 22% and, or 20% or 21%? What you don't see is the crash of large ideologies, the crash of imagination, how should our society look in Look like in, in 30, 50, 50, 50, 50 years. Some authors argue, of course, there are still ideologies that that don't that, that believe that we are able to 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 to, to, mm, to form to form future future world. But they are in the minority, and sometimes they are very dangerous in, because they are radical radical ideology ideologies. But because of these radical ideologies, there are not 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 a clash of 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 these great uh, great projects and imaginations and the consequence uh, um, the consequence um, Sigmund Baumann made is that we are probably at the end of the time of, of the period of historical period of utopias utopias is very typical that utopias appeared at the beginnings of early modern times, at the very beginnings of modernity, and somewhere at the end of modernity, somewhere they, 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 they disappear. And the answer is that that's what uh, the, the thing or the tendency Baumann has described and observed is, is a kind of, of answer of this situation. If we are not able to form our future, so instead of the future, we will form our our past, and that's 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 the background uh, for for speaking of retrotopy. We would need a lot of time to describe that or different ex examples in uh, 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 of the, on the uh, in the politics of history and in uh, different countries, not. Poland, Hungary, but also democratic countries, or liberal democratic, not also democratic, or liberal, or liberal democratic countries uh, tends to develop their own retrotopical historical policies. Maybe, for
for example, through the agenda of Geschichtsbewältigung in German case or, or Geschichtsverständigung. Uh, but uh, one example to the very end, because I think I'm speaking for 15 minutes, maybe? 13. 13, so two minutes. So I would recall one, one very specific phenomena in the last, maybe also 30 years in, 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 in international, transcultural, but predominantly Western historical thought, or, or the, 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 the thought on uh, policy of history, and that's the, that's the medium of historical apologies. The praxis of historical apologies. You could, we can observe that in the 1990s, at the beginning uh, with the 1990s, these practices uh, uh, were very frequently, almost every uh, every meeting of politicians in in Europe or outside of Europe. So 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 journeys of European politicians outside of Europe were were were, were, were somewhere connected with dealing with history and sometimes. Uh, connected with apologies, ap uh, apologies for history. And so what is very important in this practice is the new tendency since the 1990s, the apology, so, so the idea that through apology I can repair, repair what was done or, or what, what took place in, in history at, at least at, at, a moral, at a moral level. So, so to re-establish a moral balance but the tendency to go farther and farther, farther, deeper and deeper in the in the in the history. So 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 we are uh, today not only discussing possibly apologize for what was done, what took place in the 20th century, some some 50 or 70 or 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 or, or, or 80 years ago, but we are speaking on of 19th century. Sometimes uh, think of of this this uh, colonialism uh, discourse, Some, sometimes we are also discussing apologies, or expecting we not expecting apologies for for what took place in the 16th uh, century. The Pope make made an apology for cru, 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 crusade crusades in the in the 12th and and and, and 13th century what 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 is very important in this moment is that we have no discussion where are the limits for that because and that that that's that's, that's obvious that we have the tendency to develop to develop endless uh, endless Numbers or endless possibility to define perpetrators group and we uh, and, and victim groups. Every of us is potentially member of endless many uh, victim and perpetrators group through the history. And what is important? This our position depends not only from the history itself, but from our identities nowadays. So so for, from the from the question if. If and how far we are identifying nowadays, nowadays with, an, with a group in 13th or 16th or, or, or 17th century or with, an, with another group. And now we can, we can see that this retrotropic history has still to do with identity building. Uh, and that in this point, uh, retrotropic practices still remains rem, uh, rem, uh, remain to be influenced by historicist historicist think of the way of thinking about the role of the of the past past is something that is very, uh, the past is a very yeah decisive circumstances for our for our uh, for our roles in the society and for our identities uh, for our possibilities, for what is, what some authors calls, uh, used to call, accumulation of moral moral capital, that can be, that can be used in political political context. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for respecting the time, Joe. So that's in minutes precisely, and I would like to pass the word to Claire to be now. Uh, you've got a presentation. Yes. Uh, by the start, I just briefly present 
Um, yourself, you've uh, been, um, you know, has a PhD, uh, graduated in uh, the PhD at Samara State University. I uh, was an assistant professor at Russian Academy of Sciences Institute for Anthropology and Ethnology, like Russian State University for Human Sciences, the Moscow School of Social and Economic Science. And she's been also for a long time coordinator for history and scientific exchange for the Friedrich Adam Stiftung in Russia. And since 2022, she's research associate at the Humboldt University in Berlin. And we will hear about memorial laws leading to memorial wars. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I tried. Oh, it's difficult. <laughs> I try to um, respect the time. So the title that you see, "Memory from Memory Laws to Memory Wars," actually, it's a little bit. I borrowed a part of it uh, from the title of the book of Nikolai Kopasov, "Memory Laws, Memory Wars: The Politic of the Past in the in, in the Europe and the Russia." And his definition of the memory laws, so you see here, was contained in France in 2000 to refer the, to legislation and penalties Holocaust negotiation. Uh, so it's very famous, I think, that probably everybody knew it, but I put it anyway. And uh, the notion can be used both in a broad sense, uh, encompassing all laws, that regulate collective representation of the past and in the narrow sense of prohibition of Holocaust denial and other similar legislation. So it's very complicated, actually, a notion. The term, uh, rather than a single type of legislation, the term, in fact, covers a complex of different through related phenomena. In the broadest sense, uh, it includes laws that define state symbols, create museums or grant amnesties or benefits to participants in certain historical events. It's also there in this legislation. Um, so it's the book of Nikolai Kopasov. Uh, so memory laws from 2000 already and from 19th actually became a pan-European phenomenon. Okay, it must be how to turn it back. Uh, that must, okay, put the boss of this. Actually, I want to, to show only one. But, uh, <clears throat> so in a post-war, post-2000 uh, war, tw uh, Second World War, I just, in this contemporary war, we need this um, to say it already. In the post-war decades, historians developed an increased focus of the oppressed and eventually moved from what already Milos also told from supposedly objective social history to the interest in multiple subjectivities. This paved the way for a democratization in the form of memory boom that stripped historians of their monopoly on legitimate history writing. So the past has become a source of Inosus heritage defined by its role in the present. So it because of memory boom, and since 1930, European countries have, law, have laws criminalizing statements about the past on their books. So, however, initially conceived as a means of maintaining peace, these laws have increased, um, instead become one of the preferred instruments of the memory wars within and between many European countries. And the war that we see now, it's unfortunately also the part of this, um, how to, yeah. So what Georgi Kasyanov in his uh, new book uh, called Memory Crash, that memory crash, uh, political history in, uh, in all and around Ukraine. So memory laws were important instrument in the memory war between Russia and Ukraine also in 2014. Uh, and now it's unfortunately a real war. So all fans of memory laws sport, so how Nora uh, calls it in France, so it's French sport, yeah, memory laws, need to be aware of its potential dangers. Um, oops. Uh, could you help me to <laughs> come back? I was too quick. Ah, yeah. Not a mouse. Okay, so, thank you. So, 
laws that regulate collective representations of the past are not new phenomena, but laws that criminalize certain statements about the past are, are they are new. Even in USSR, with its formidable system of censorship, had no memory laws in the narrow sense. Yeah? The emergence of memory laws is, in the strict sense, shows that in the age of memory, the past became even more important for cultural identity and political legitimation than it was in the age of history-based political ideologies. Uh, uh, the laws that criminalize certain statements about the past, uh, uh, this <laughs> sorry, that's a put here, um, and it was a confusion. Also, even, uh, it's uh, doubled, as a two, two times put it in, I don't know how it happened, actually. But <clears throat> I hope that you can read. So what's happened now in Russia, we can call crimes against history. That's a term, that, uh, a very famous term of Anton de Bates, that he wrote a book, Crimes Against History, in 2018. Uh, that he pictured that you here seeing, that's a uh, dismantling of plaque of memory of the victims of the Great Terror uh, and the Katyn massacre. It was in Tver, 2020, it's photo from International Memorial. <clears throat> and uh, I just want, to skip uh, very shortly, that's memory, so to call memory laws in Russia. Um, that actually I put in a, 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 under crimes against uh, history. During President Putin's first term, 2000, 2004, the president and administration denied any need for a state ideology. Putin cast himself as a non ideological figure, claiming to be working solemnly in the line with technocrats' objectives. The aggressive offensive of historical politics became visible to all after Medvedev presidency, so after 2012. The first known law is Article 354.1 of the Criminal Court of the Russian Federation, which criminalizes the rehabilitation of the Nazism, so to say. That's a long title. I, I come back to this article. Further, the law was introduced in the State Duma during Medvedev presidency in 2009, but the bill provoked widespread disapproval, including in the cabinet of ministers. It was not discussed for several years, and until it was just quickly passed in May, in May 2014, against the backdrop of the Ukrainian crisis. No, and 2020 it became a part of the Russian. Constitution of the Constitution of the Russian Federation. Uh, so, this article 345.1 is a dissemination of unknownly false information on the activities of the USSR during the Second World War. That is original title. Uh, the title of the law is misleading. Uh, for it actually penalizes a much broader range of expressions, yeah? not only about Nazi crimes, but also about the role of the Soviet Union in the Second World War as a such, and about Russian military history in general. So, and rather than protect uh, the dignity of individual victims, what's actually memory laws must do, uh, or victim from state crimes, they pr propose in Raza that, in quote, uh, to enforce an officially sanctioned way of relating to the past as a means of strengthening national identity. Yeah, quotation end. This uh, clauses permit uh, the state to prosecute those who share government disapproved, as I read, false views of Soviet Union policies during the Second World War, or who express disrespectful opinion about Russian military history. So, and it, what is it will be dis, uh, disrespectful decided the state, of course. Between 2014, uh, 15 and 2018, this enforcement of this article on the criminal court has resulted in 25 convictions, uh, and only one acquittal not including an unknown number of criminal cases that did not reach trial. Ironically, that is a man they are seeing here, that's ironically only acquittal under this article was a Holocaust denial case. 
that the man denied the Holocaust. Um, and he was acquitted. Uh, Roman Yushkov, a resident of PM, wrote on social media that the so-called Holocaust was a shameless swindle intended for non-Jews, Germans, Russians, and everyone else. This quotation end. He also questions the Holocaust death and saying that estimate of six million Jews was, quotation, great fraud. It, it was because of uh, some, as, as a context, yes, because of uh, proposed bu um, building of uh, memorial, Jews memo Holocaust memorial, actually, uh, how to say it in, Alexei, what is the name of this memorial was? It's Holocaust memorial, must be constructed in Perm, I think. Uh, but okay, as I, I forget the, the name of this museum that was proposed, and it, it was his reaction on this proposal. But anyway, he uh, actually uh, named the Holocaust and six million Jews great fraud, and uh, at first he, um, he was enforced in this article, after that acquittal. And he was only one in 25 cases, yeah. Instead, the majority of the other proceedings under article, uh, to the extent their publicity available, concern those who spoke about the Soviet Union international crimes committed between 1939 and 1945, questioned the official narrative Soviet Union role in the Second World War, or invoked history in the critique of the current regime. The, all of these people was convicted. Um, so this article uh, no, uh, is particularly striking in, in nowadays what's happened now. So you, you all know that in 2014, uh, the annexion of Krim, Second World War played a great role, uh, so it's all symbolic. And what's striking is current only slight reference to the Great Patriotic War. Yeah, look at these pictures. Uh, it was a 2014, yeah, this was 2014 as na Berlin, as on uh, this quotation from the Second World War. But now, nothing like of that. We, we not see the banner on, on uh, autos na Berlin or something. And, and this is a picture of the um, 9 Mai pa parade in St. Petersburg. That's the uniform of Russian pol police battalion. So I don't know, is it... Um, what's designers thought about it? Yeah, probably just a special uh, kind of <laughs> yeah, blaming, yeah, so it's some kind of uh, uh, silent protest <laughs> probably from designers yeah, because everybody can read, uh, yeah, how does it look like? Uh, and, and, and the other picture, yeah, from the parade in 90 May. So, all this can repeat uh, actually goes back to this inspiration left by Soviet soldiers on the walls of the Reichstag. There's no, no nothing in, in, in this discourse of this, this war, uh, 2022. So it's very interesting that actually it's refined to the Second World War, but this memorial law <laughs> that actually uh, must, uh, must uh, help uh, to, to create a, a, a good view about the Second World War, they now working otherwise. Yeah? Uh, as radical as it is, the Russian case, uh, uh, that points to broader tendencies, I think, in the evolution of the legislation of memory, which is now being widely used in promoting national nationalistic goals. And another have it, do I have a time? Yeah. It's another laws, five new laws, uh, that actually already mostly not about the Second World War, but about fake news. But uh, nothing, now it's everything is fake, uh, what's actually uh, been against uh, what the government saying about this war. Uh, so you can see, I just put it here, that what, I'm, what I mean. And it's... Uh, a lot of people was convicted already, yeah. And the five team, in the, when the first article, this 2,354, uh, it was only 25 uh, people in uh, some years. Then here now it's uh, more than 50 or more than 100. And it's now, and the first article was five years, and now it's 15 years and 20 years, yeah. So it's much harder <coughs> than our Russian institution. 
Actually, it's now it's criminal law. Um, for the years after the Crimea annexation, mostly administrative law, so you pay money and you stay free, but now it's criminal law, so you go to prison. That's it's a great difference, of course. Um, and and then just something nice in the end <laughs> about <laughs> that's uh, using of the history and uh, from the uh, society actually as a protest. Yes, yeah, so this first one and the, on, on your right. Yeah, that's uh, for endless twenty years we have waited with hope for the belly. Yeah, so Belly Swan Lake was a symbol of the death of Soviet leaders. And I was, I was a child, I, I've seen it every two years, yeah, because they <laughs> died and <laughs> very often. Uh, and it, it was the only one uh, was you, you could see in, in uh, Russian television and Soviet television at this time. Uh, so that's the people playing with this, yeah, it's a belly figures, it's four belly figures, like um, a silent protest, um, also using the history, actually. And the other one from your from your le le left is uh, this old ballerinas, but it's uh, just uh, instead of the letters, yeah, no war. It's net vaine. It's so five uh, vaine and net. It's uh, three letters, so no war. It's just something that um, uh, to remember that the society also uses history in this way. Uh, but actually, the mo most important point that I want uh, to put here in my presentation that is. Uh, uh, we need to be very, very accurate uh, as a very aware with uh, memory laws that's widespread in Europe because they're mostly used now for actually nationalistic uh, ideas that uh, to to defend uh, the victims of some uh, state criminal and then also bring uh, specific uh, historical consciousness um, um, together. So probably this, all these wars, actually memory wars, is uh, actually reciprocal to reciprocal. It's, a, it's, it's an English word uh, to uh, to this memory war, or laws that was uh, from 19 developed from the nine, 2000 actually. Thank you for attention. And it's my um, big pleasure to <laughs> give the word to the next. Uh, this one, which is Professor Luba Jurgensson, a memorial studies specialist, literary historian, writer, translator, and essayist. Uh, she obtained her PhD, the, um, the Indecible of the Real in the Works of Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Bernard Shalamov in 2001 at Suburban University. There are also her postdoctoral qualification as the Rehabilitation Schrift, a trace and testimony in the work of Madame Shalamov in 2009. Since 2002, she works at Sorbonne as associate, and since 2016, as full professor. She is also the director of the Mixed Research Unit of OBEM, Cultures and Societies of Central Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Uh, young Riedel, no, she's not Young Riedel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> not yet. Uh, she's the Vice President of the Associ Association Memorial France, and uh, she's Knight of the French National Forum. Luba, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mateusz, and thank uh, to all the, all, uh, the organizers for, for inviting me. So I will speak about some issues of uh, memory studies, uh, some present issues. On February 2024, 20, researchers working on Russia lost their research fields, their Russian collaborators and partners, and their projects uh, related to Russia. For those who, like me, work on the memory of violence, this shock was coupled with the feeling of powerlessness that was expressed through a question, is it still relevant to work on the memory on the past of the past when such violence is taking place in the present. Not only did the work of memory to which I tried to contribute with my research, but also with the Memorial Association, not prevent the war, but the fact that I had analyzed the states of uh, amazement experienced and described by the witnesses of extreme violence was of no help to me when I myself, without being a direct witness of the war, uh, felt an amazement in front of the events 
that we were following li following life uh, that prevented me from thinking. Like everyone else, I expressed it with the most banal words. Uh, I can't believe it. I want to wake up, and so on. In the same time, I answered several requests for explanations uh, about Putin's uh, instrumentalization of historical, historical memory, about the reasons for the persecution and dissolution of memorial, about the links between the gradual invisibi invisibilization of the memory of the Gulag in Russia, the valorization of the Stalinist period, and the current war. This seemed to show that the research we had done on this question was rather useful. In, it is thus in a back and forth between the awareness of the necessity of research on the memory of the past and that of it, uh, its uh, failure that this communication is inscribed. Since the First World War and the emergence of the figure of the witness is central to the construction of memory, memorial mechanisms ha have been put in place from the beginning of conflicts. Thus, during the First World War, World War those who mastered writing were requested to produce testimonies. While it is, of course, impossible to predict the path that will be taken in the construction of the memory of the present war, Initiatives are also emerging almost everywhere, including in France. They are often based on the collection of oral interviews and the constitution of oral archives. Thus, I am personally aware of three projects that will be conducted within Eurorbem and others uh, emerging in, at CERSEC, uh, to mention only two Parisian research centers. I myself have a project to collect testimonies. That researchers will soon have a vast corpus of oral archives, including interviews with the Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians. Various questions will then arise. How to preserve them, these interviews? How to make them accessible? How to use them? Among these researchers, which often focus of the, on the experience of exile, we can identify several tracks. The exile of, exile of women, for example, and children. The question of reception and uh, hospitality. Uh, the, coming in go the comings and goings. Uh, some leave, then come back. Some leave uh, Ukraine and come back to Ukraine. The trauma, the identity, the impact of propaganda. How can we build a coherent knowledge on the war from there? And how will these interviews participate in the construction of memory, of the memory? The interviewees answer questions that are being asked today. How can tomorrow's researchers find answers to tomorrow's questions? Moreover, some research remains unresolved. For example, I would like to investigate the destruction of the landscape, my current research topic. But it is not easy to ask these kinds of questions to people whose lives or the lives of their relatives are in danger. In danger. The landscape appears as a question of post-memory, which can only be conducted after the fact, after the war. But we do not know today the extent of the destruction that has already occurred and will occur in the future. Nor do we know what observational devices should be put in place to monitor this destruction. I am thus in this paradoxical, paradoxical situation where, on the one hand, the present offers an exceptional field of research, and on the other hand, this field can only be explored when it belongs to the past, and I do not know the duration on which to project myself. If I manage to carry out this research, which I hope I will, it will be a test of the methodologies, methodologies developed to think about the past in areas that are suitable for post-memory. 
Another question that arises for researchers in memory studies, it's a very delic delicate question, is the link between memory and political commitment. Certainly, questions of memory have al always been political. If uh, scientific neutrality has often been in uh, an attainable goal in this field, today it is even more difficult to preserve it. Because this neutrality could and can today be undermined not only by the political posi positioning of researchers, but also by the evolution of the countries in which the research fields are located. Thus, in recent years, the reluct reluctance of uh, certain uh, Central and uh, Middle European countries to confront the memory of complicity in the Shoah has led researchers, and especially <coughs> Western and French researchers, uh, to focus more on this memory, on the memory of uh, the Holocaust, than on the memory of Soviet, uh, Soviet violence, from which these same countries have derived a victimid, uh, victimized identity, forgetting the complexity of the history, history of, of the, their bloody lands. In this context, the visibility of Soviet repressions and the demands for recognition of their memory in the same way as the memory of the Holocaust have shocked many researchers who have seen in it a minimization of the genocide or even in a usurpation of the place of the victims by community that have, done, that have not done their work of remembrance of the dark spots in their history. These are highly subject, sensitive, sensitive, excuse me, sensitive subjects. <laughs> I, I go quickly, because, uh, which the current war requires us to revisit. For example, the rise of nationalism in Central Europe has sometimes led to a negative perception of the Solidarność movement or uh, Charter 77, the memorial laws condemning the, crime, the crimes of communism in the same way as Nazi, Nazi crimes or the decommunization of the urban space in ex-communist countries. The appearance of monuments to Bandera in Ukraine, the heroization of the own in Ukraine and the cursed soldier, soldiers in Poland only reinforced the idea that decommunization goes hand in hand with the denial of minimization of the Shoah. Among the arguments that have been proposed to invalidate the paralleling of Nazi and Soviet crimes was the absurdity of considering that the forces that liberated Auschwitz that is to say Soviet army, are identical to those that committed the genocide there. Now we see that the discourse of the liberation of Europe by the Soviet army is one of the key points in Putin's propaganda for the war. This invalidates this argument, which is moreover very problematic because it was already used by the pro-Stalinist after the Second World War. Second World War. Among these uh, very sensitive topics, there is the question of the Holodomor. This question has evolved over the last decade. The claims to qualify the Holodomor as genocide had met with some resistance in French academic circles for various reason, reasons, notably because these claims were perceived as the expression of a war of memories, the memory of Holodomor, of the Holodomor being in competition with the genocide of the Jews and intending, intended to cover it up. But also because, as we know, Ukraine was not the only territory to be hit by the famine. This, um, the famine. This one, this one was used as weapon against all the populations which resisted to the collectivization, especially in the richest regions with, with which knew the most terrible levels of their reserves. It was thus necessary to consider the whole of the Soviet famines in order to understand the specific logics on the Ukraine. This is the work that Nicolas Wert, 
has, do, has done in France, showing that there was indeed a Ukrainian specificity. Uh, for example, only in Ukraine was the ban of living villages affected by famine really applied. In this sense, Nicola Verd's book, recent book, brings a much more subtle vision that, than that of Anna Applebaum, who sees the famine especially under the national angle. On one side, the Russian occupiers, and on the other side, the autochthonous Ukrainian, Ukrainians. Things are much more, much more complicated, and the Ukrainian famine must be seen in the more general context of the relationship between the Soviet state and the peasants. Ahead of these, uh, of these two important books, uh, of, uh, that of Nicolas Vert and uh, Anne Applebaum, Applebaum, the great historian Annette Becker, uh, also a French historian, had inclu included in the English edition of uh, her book, Messengers of Disaster, published in 2022, uh, the issue of uh, genocide in Ukraine. The book is about uh, genocides and about Lemkin, Lemkin in particular. Uh, the issue of genocide in Ukraine that she had previously left out of the French version published in 2018. Indeed, Lemkin, in the end of her, his life, considered the Holodomor as genocide. The question of genocide ultimately seems secondary for historians to the question of deep Byzantization, but for memory studies, as well as for researchers involved with Ukraine, it takes on a new meaning today. If yesterday the memory of the Holodomor could be felt as a memory against that of the Holocaust, today this memory authorizes a comparison between the two events. The extermination by hunger and that by ballots of gas and becomes a complicit memory of that of the uh, Holocaust. The cinema has contributed to this inversion of meanings. The film of Agnieszka Holland, Mr. Jones, and uh, of uh, 2019, and that very recent of Guillaume Ribot, um, Bloody Harvest, showing that sin since the annexation of Crimea, uh, the question of the Holodomor has resurface it in a strong way. <clears throat> uh, Putin's blackmail of famine and the wheat war, the present wheat war, have also contributed to reactualization of this question, showing to what extent the weapon of famine was part of the Russian arsenal and of the Russian political unconscious. As a, an example of the porosity between memorial studies and commitment to this issue, I can say that I myself signed a collective letter written by several researchers now and published it in the journal Esprit in favor, in favor of the recognition of uh, the Holodomor as genocide. I have uh, some time? Two minutes? <laughs> okay. Finally, I see another important path emerging from the current situation, namely a great integration of studies of Russian colonialism and the memory of Russian and Soviet violence into post-colonial studies. Indeed, post-colonial studies are resisting to build bridges uh, to the question of political violence in the U.S.S. USSR and its memory, memorial posterity, which is, however, inseparable from, from any reflection to one of the greatest, greatest modern empires. One of them is uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, undoubtedly <laughs> uh, that the Soviet, uh, that of the Soviet domination, that the Soviet domination was taught, taught off by the actors of memory in the regions concerned more in terms of occupations. Notably, notably in the case of the former Western republics and in Georgia, more than colonization. 
another reason probably has to do with the memory inscribed in the post-colonial field itself. During the period of decolonization, the uh, Soviet Union played the anti-colonial card, po positioning itself as the defender of oppressed people, with the aim of taking part in the new division of the world and avoiding economic colonization by, by the West. This discourse taken up by the actors of the anti-colonial struggle has durably prevented the part of the Western liberal intelligentsia from recognizing uh, the repressive aspects of the Soviet system and its legacy, legacy still weighs, weighs on Euro or Western-centric post-colonial studies. It seems to me that today the situation is changing and the crossroads between historiography, historiography memory studies and colonial studies will be more fruitful from now on. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mbayogetsa. And which enables me also, we've got still almost perfect timing. Thank you so very much. And I'm now give the words to Professor Jan Redel, historian of Central and Eastern Europe and Polish national relations, author, uh, author of Politics of History in the Federal Republic of Germany, Legacy, Ideas, Practice in 2011, and Polish Occupation of Northwestern Germany 1945-1948, an unknown chapter in Polish German relations, published in 2000. Until 2010, he was a researcher and a professor at Jagiellonia University and is currently a professor of the Pedagogical University of Krakow. Between 2001 and 2005, he headed the Office of Culture, Science and Information at the Polish Embassy in Berlin. Since 2008, he has been Poland's representative on the board of the Polish German Foundation for Sciences and the coordinator of the Polish part of the European, European Network for Remembrance and Solidarity. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I, I would say um, the title of my um, contribution should be perhaps uh, Poland and Ukraine, some essayistic comments on the historical uh, premises of their mutual uh, uh, relations. Uh, the history of Polish Kievian uh, Polish Ruthenian uh, and Polish Ukrainian relation is as old or as young, depending on the one's point of view, as Polish statehood. The history of these relations is extremely volatile uh, and intense. Uh, they contain beautiful and heroic chapters, as well as ones marked by sorrow and shame. Uh, they are fixed uh, in the historical consciousness of Poles and uh, arouse great emotions to this day, uh, both positive and negative. Uh, the sui generis mood uh, swings uh, resemble a sine curve. Uh, the Polish song, Hey Sokoły, uh, Hey You Falcons, was composed by Maciej Kamieński at the beginning of the 19th century. The author of its lyrics is unknown, uh, but uh, he can be ascribed to the circle of what is referred to as, uh, to as a Ukrainian school of Polish romanticism. Uh, you can start for a few seconds. Uh, this... Tutaj w polskim lasku dla was sokoły. <laughs> żal, żal za dziewczyną, za zieloną Ukrainą. Żal, żal serce płacze, już cię nigdy nie zobaczę. Hej, 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 hey, hey, hey. hey, sokoły, omijajcie góry, lasy, doły. Dzwoń, 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 dzwoneczku, mój stepowy zgowroneczku. Hej, 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 hey, sokoły, omijajcie góry, lasy, doły. Dzwoń, 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 dzwoneczku, mój stepowy dzwoń, dzwoń, dzwoń. Ona 
Uh, that's enough. Uh, 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 the, the song Hey Sokoły has been widely known in Poland for 200 years and belongs to the staple favorites of popular music accompanying all kinds of Polish fiests. Uh, in the Ukraine, of which its lyric speaks, the song is rapidly, in uh, uh, 2019, uh, uh, gaining popularity. You can uh, start the next part of, uh, of the song. Thank you very much for helping me. Uh, uh, Sokoły is an example of the constant presence of a certain positive image of Ukraine uh, and all things Ukrainian uh, in the consciousness of Poles, uh, which is uh, now being applied in, U in Ukraine itself. Note uh, that there is no such song about Poles in traditional uh, German culture, nor is there such a song about Germans in Polish culture. You can say also about just the same about the Czech culture, I, I suppose, I'm afraid. Uh, Polish historical consciousness, however, also contains many strong, completely negative narratives about Ukrainians. Since the, uh, uh, since the time of the Cossack uprising, uh, uh, there has existed in Poland the stereotype of Ukrainian rezun, uh, from the Ukrainian word uh, rezun, meaning bocha. Butcher, uh, a sa savage murderer. Uh, this stereotype was clearly reinforced in the first half of the 20th century when, in, uh, uh, 19, in 1918, 1919, there was a hard, uh, though not yet bestial, civil war for the control over, uh, of, of Lviv and Eastern Galicia. It ended with uh, a Polish victory and the shattering of the independence aspirations of Ukrainians living in Eastern Galicia. Today's Western, uh, today's Western Ukraine. During the interwar period, uh, the conflict in these areas smoldered uh, continuously. Ukrainians uh, formed increasingly radical nationalist organizations using terror against the Polish state. The Poles responded with very brutal repressions by the police and army, and army uh, including acts as heinous as the demolition of Orthodox churches. The hatred was spiraling ever faster. It exploded during the Second World War. The climax uh, came between February uh, 1943 and December 1944 when units of the Ukrainian insurgent army carried out an insanely cruel ethnic cleansing in the territory of first Volhynia and then Eastern Galicia and partly Polesia. Between 80 uh, and 100,000 Poles, around 1,200 still surviving Jews, and approximately 900 Ukrainians who opposed the the murders lost their lives uh, at the time. As a result, uh, Polish defensive operations and retaliation by the Home Army uh, no less uh, than 
3,000 Ukrainians were killed. Some believe much more. The ethnic cleansing proved effective as the prospect of living under Soviet rule among hostile uh, Ukrainians prompted Poles to flee the, the area en masse. Thus, uh, for example, the number of Poles in the Volinian voivodeship dropped from uh, 16.5% uh, 16 to 3 per mile. Uh, 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 the systemic Polish uh, vengeance affected Ukrainians living with, within Poland's borders after 1945. They, they were displaced uh, from uh, their native territories in the southeast uh, of present-day Poland to Lower Silesia and East Prussia in 1947 as part of the communist operation Vistula. In view of the recent traumatic experiences, uh, this displacement was uh, quite widely supported by Poles uh, uh, and became one of the relatively few factors legitimizing uh, communist rule in the country. It took a relatively long time uh, for, uh, for views challenging uh, uh, the uniformly gloomy image of Ukraine and Ukrainians. Uh, to, uh, so, sorry, I, I forget to move my presentation. Uh, in the uh, 70s, knowledge uh, of the uh, now famous uh, Gedroich Mieroszewski doctrine formulated by emigres in Paris and London. Uh, stating that, uh, that Poles could only permanently break, from, uh, break free from Moscow hegemony if they did so jointly with Ukrainians, Lithuanians and Belarusians, became widespread in Poland. Uh, the idea of a strategic agreement with the immediate neighbors living in, to the east of Poland became an important, if not most important, component of Polish geopolitical thought during the, the 80s. The events of uh, 1989 to 1991 in Central and Eastern Europe seemed to, uh, to be putting uh, the Gedroich Mieroszewski doctrine into practice uh, in the Deus ex machina fashion. After the collapse of the USSR, Poland was the first country in the world to recognize the independence of Ukraine. Relevant treaties on good neighborhood and friendship were soon concluded uh, with genuinely high hopes in Poland. Close and trusting military contacts were also quickly established, which proved to be very dura durable. The film adaptation of Henryk Sienkiewicz's novel uh, With Fire and Sword, uh, which was widely known in Poland uh, and uh, important for Polish identity in the late 19th century and 20th century too, uh, became a kind of cultural and or historical political representation of these hopes and emerging cooperation. The novel is set in the years 1648-1648 uh, uh, during the great Cossack uprising led by Bohdan Mielnitsky. Mm. It was an exceptionally cruel and devastating conflict that started the downfall of Poland and at the same time marked uh, the beginning of Ukraine dependence on Moscow. Sienkiewicz uh, portrayed Khmelnytsky as a demonic traitor of, to the common mother, the, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Cossacks 
and Ruthenian uh, Ukrainian people as wronged by Polish magnates, uh, freedom loving but dim, savage and cruel. Uh, dire uh, director Jerzy Hoffman, who had already successfully filmed two of Schenkiewicz's novels that together with, the, with Fire and Sword make up the Polish trilogy, faced a very difficult task in, in the 90s, uh, as he wanted to tell the contents of this novel without galvanizing Polish-Ukrainian antagonism. He succeeded in this by showing Chmielnicki as a statement uh, and the main uh, Cossack protagonist, Bohun, uh, as, uh, a, as a personality de facto equal to the Polish main characters in the novel. Partly, he achieved this by casting in these roles very prominent Ukrainian and Russian actors, Bohdan Stupka and Alexander Domogarov. The film, which uh, uh, premiered in 19, 1999, became a great success in both Poland and Ukraine and genuinely contributed to uh, contributed uh, to um, increased empathy and mutual in mutual relations however developments in Ukraine did not uh, sorry be better that. <laughs> uh, uh, however, uh, developments in Ukraine did not confirm the optimistic prediction of the early 90s. The country was not making the necessary reforms. The oligarchs divided the economy and the political scene between themselves, uh, uh, and uh, corruption seemed omnipresent. Poland, on the other hand, focused uh, on its efforts to join Na NATO, NATO and th the European U Union increasingly turned in its back on Ukraine, neglecting contacts and building up its influence there. To make matter matters worse, some patriotically minded Ukrainian politicians in an attempt to integrate society, reached back to the traditions of the Ukrainian nationalist movement and the Ukrainian insurgent army from the Second World War. They expected the anti-Russian stance of this organization and their fierce struggle against the Soviets, which lasted until the mid-50s, uh, uh, at the same time, they ignored the fact that as the wartime mass murders were very much uh, present in Poland's living uh, memory, uh, these traditions were completely unacceptable uh, there as a constitutive uh, component of Ukrainian identity. Relations uh, between uh, two countries reminded cool and anti-Ukrainian Polish commentators became increasingly vocal. The efforts of the Polish-Ukrainian churches trying to initiate reconciliation using the uh, we, give, uh, we forgive and ask forgiveness formula so helpful in the case of Polish-German reconciliation did not help. Uh, the peak of, of the trend exposing the tragic aspect of Polish-Ukrainian relation uh, uh, in the first half of uh, uh, 20th century uh, turned out to be uh, the film Volynia, Volyny, uh, which uh, uh, premiered in October 2016. It was made by uh, Wojciech Smarzowski, one of the more efficient contemporary Polish directors, specializing, however, in the most drastic subject matter uh, portrayed in a re uh, realistic manner. Someone said uh, uh, that Wojciech, Wojciech Smarzowski makes uh, films using the axe. 
the, you see, see the X in the hand of the director. Uh, conceptual work on the film had been going on since uh, 2011, and uh, shooting began in early 2014, when the film received funding from the Polish Film Institute. Let me also point out uh, that uh, the rector is a fierce opponent of the current Polish, Polish government and uh, anti, very anti-cleric. Uh, the film is uh, certainly not a primitive propaganda attack on Ukraine. Nevertheless, sorry, uh, never, uh, nevertheless, the realistic scenes of the slaughter by, of Poles by Ukrainian insurgent army dominated the perception of the film. The work provoked an icy reaction in Ukraine. The Ukrainian actors who starred, uh, starred uh, in, the, uh, in it were uh, condemned. Its premiere uh, in Ukraine was cancelled. Uh, in contrast, the film was a huge box office success in Poland. Uh, in the same year when uh, Wołyń premiered, uh, the Polish same est established the uh, long term uh, the National Day of Remembrance for the victims of genocide committed by Ukrainian nationalists against the citizens of Second Polish Republic, as its uh, fu full name reads. As it seems, another turn in Polish-Ukrainian relations took place in late uh, 2018, early 2019. The celebrations of the centenary of Poland, Poland's regained uh, independence began then, uh, stretching from 2018 to 2021. Uh, that is covering basically the entire peri period of the formation of the states. Uh, in this wide-ranging and, uh, by Polish standards, <laughs> well-prepared celebrations, the centenary of the fight against the Ukrainians uh, in Western Galicia played a minor role. Instead, the Polish-Ukrainian alliance uh, concluded between uh, the Marshal jo Józef Piłsudski and the President of the Ukrainian People's Republic, Simon Petlura, uh, the joint seizure of Kiev to rebuild the Ukrainian state and the joint uh, fight against Bolshevik invasion was highlighted. Sorry, more photographs. I, I have no time to explain the details. Uh, the pro-Ukrainian turn in Polish attitudes reached uh, an absolute and truth be told uh, for everyone, even experts, unexpected peak with Russian massive attack on Ukraine on uh, uh, 24, uh, 4th of February. Its manifestation was the widespread, essentially not inspired and uh, initially not coordinated by the states, action by the state, action of help refugees crossing the Polish border in 10,000s from day one. Uh, as well as the, uh, to send humanitarian, medical and other aid to Ukraine. Individual Poles bought and sent to Ukraine clothing, shoes, first aid kits, rucksacks, night vision equipment, helmets and bull bulletproof uh, uh, vests for uh, uh, Ukrainian soldiers. The, new, uh, the news of large supplies of Polish weapons to Ukraine were... Mm, sorry, I forget once again to show the according pictures. Uh, the news of large supplies of Polish weapons to Ukraine was received with full support, even enthusiasm. I don't know and uh, do not uh, uh, want to know how many volunteers from Poland are fighting on the front line in Ukraine today. Uh, opinion polls showed that in March of this year, 94% uh, 
percent of Poles declared themselves ready to accept the refugees from Ukraine. Um, at the same time, uh, um, 63 percent of respondents declared uh, that they uh, provided such assistance. A similar turnout, uh, turn around, and uh, sorry, uh, occurred in Ukraine. Opinion polls conducted uh, 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 there showed that 83 uh, percent of the people. Uh, excluding refugees residing abroad, had a very good or good attitude towards Poland. And 33% be believed that the best term to describe its relation to Pol Poles was brother and sisters. And um, so on, I, I, I have to be, come to conclusion. If we think about the possible consequences of this ex explosion of mutual goodwill uh, and the generosity uh, in Polish-Ukrainian relations combined with uh, fundamental improvement in Polish-Lithuanian relations and the ex extensive and long-standing assistance that Poland has been providing to Belarusian opposition, we can speak of uh, not only the implementation of the Giedroyt Mieroszewski doctrine, but even the contours uh, of the former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth emerging from the Clausewitz uh, fog of war. Uh, even today, even today, maps of uh, this budding community of Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Lithuanians, Latvians and Estonians <laughs> uh, uh, can be found in the internet. So, sorry, a few more sentences. Uh, a fortnight ago, the uh, respected political and military analyst and advisor uh, to the president of Ukraine, uh, Oleksiy Arestovich, said that a conditio, conditio sine qua non for a lasting end uh, of the conflict uh, uh, with Russia was the formation of close alliance and coalition of Ukraine, Poland, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Could it be that history has come full circle after 400 years? Uh, on, uh, uh, let me uh, read uh, to the end. Lithuanian President Gitanas Nauseda attended this year's Independence Day celebrations uh, in Poland on 11th uh, November, of November. He said, the tradition of resistance uh, to injustice and love of freedom handed down uh, from generation to generation is close to every pole. Uh, we Lithuanians value it too. It is a wealth inherited uh, from common past uh, of Lithuania and Poland. Since ancient uh, times, our two countries have been united by the duty to defend the values of civilization. Now, Seda stressed, uh, 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 on the same day, uh, in message uh, of the Ukrainian uh, 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 president, uh, we can could hear, uh, um, dear Poland, Poland, you are our sister. You know, po Polska and U Ukraina are feminine. Poland, you are our sister. We have had uh, some ups and downs in our relations, but we are a family. And today, we, uh, when we face an old common enemy, enemy, uh, we are together. So I ask again. Has history come full circle after 400 years? To conclude, let me make a few more general uh, and unfortunately rather obvious observations. History does not determine uh, today's events or today's political decisions, as, as it is rather geography, as geopolitician and geostrategists claim, that is such a determining factor. 
Uh, history does, however, provide us with models describing certain political situations, analogies worth pondering, and patterns of behavior or sets of values worth upholding and defending. Well, Historia Magistra Vitae, uh, here is M Marcus Tullius Cicero for, for you. Uh, our Central and Eastern European teacher uh, of life, the, the Magistra, has a great deal to say to Poles, and it works in different ways. Some may speak about the century-old strategic importance of the so-called Smolensk uh, Gate, Piłsudski's policy toward Ukraine, or Gedroj Miroshevsky doctrine. Millions of, po of Poles have no idea of these, but rush to the aid of the attacked Ukrainians because they have an atavistic awareness of what uh, an invasion by barbarians from the East means. Uh, by the Mongols, uh, be the Mongols, Muscovites, Bolsheviks, or the Russists, uh, as the Ukrainian used to say in these days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've got, fortunately, thanks to some discipline, runs still 15 minutes for discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't know how we proceed with the microphones, but I'll just maybe, before giving the floor to the audience, I'd like to submit to all four of you a few reflections after having heard all those inspiring presentations. Uh, a few words that from the beginning till the end of all of the four communications we've heard appear to me pretty important, where on the one hand the necessity of reflection on memory and historical issues and their uses in the contemporary world, and the failure at the same time of such, such a politics, leading to moments, as you almost all underlined in, in different contexts, um, of how history becomes not a domain of so, such some, any kind of science, but uh, politically controlled, determined, and, and used, instrumentalized uh, realm. And between subjectivation on the one hand and instrumentalization on the other, when history becomes either politics or entertainment, as you've mentioned, and memory leads uh, from individual experience to uh, political instruments. <coughs> I would like you to reflect or to suggest maybe three domains of reflection. And feel free to follow um, each and every the one you would like to choose. Is it that, that in the face of war that lasts since eight years, that exploded particularly this year, tendencies already present have just accelerated? Did we discover newly some elements so we just fully realized in what direction are we going to. That would be the first direction. The other question would be, to what extent did we forget in our reflection in the previous decades the role of emotions, affects and narratives um, used and being able to, uh, to be used in the, um, in the politicization of history, for instance. And maybe a third one would be, how to deal with the memorial big data we are facing, actually. Uh, like last week, we had a historical games workshop at the Cetres, when we observed uh, the use of Czech medieval, among others, the use of Czech medieval past in the digital games, with, just to mention, the digital games produced, for instance, in the Czech Republic are sold in five million copies worldwide. And those are the means with elements of history appeal and manipulate and use and form, actually, the minds of the younger generations for the next years to, to, to come. And do we have, as scholars, colleagues, uh, memory of study specialists, any ways and means to answer to those new ways of, per of perceiving history, actually? Three very general directions. Feel free to answer, and then we'll open the floor to the public. If you want. Maybe I, I have some, just a little reflection about uh, the games, uh, because I participated uh, recently to, uh, and I 
co-organized a, a summer school uh, in Milano about uh, about uh, uh, digital memories with uh, two colleagues uh, who are specialists of uh, specialists of uh, uh, of digital memory and especially of uh, of electronic games and uh, they uh, according to them uh, these games can be uh, a very interesting tool in uh, teaching uh, uh, memory and history so maybe we have uh, these uh, two aspects of games but uh, what is interesting uh, uh, this in, in, in the sum of these games, we can change history. They propose an alternative history. And maybe this, uh, this power to, to, uh, uh, to intervene in the, in the way of the history is very attractive. Uh, we can uh, imagine that, uh, I don't know, uh, Troia, Troia? Troia uh, uh, won. <laughs> the the uh, the war against uh, the Greece and uh, what happened? Uh, so it uh, it uh, a big topic, a big a big um, it, a very interesting topic. Um, actually, I just very short remarks um, uh, that uh, historians not own history yeah so we, we couldn't uh, uh, demand from public that they hear in us uh, so <laughs> we need to do something that they want to hear uh, so of course it must be some kind of entertainment but we still could be experts and i, I just think that this war bring us uh, to real, to real, really uh, understanding in what extent uh, the memory wars could be, yeah. So that's that is very depressing, of course. Uh, but I mean, and that's why I spoke about memory laws. I think we need to take it seriously. Yeah. So that's an historical consciousness that uh, they provided by these memory laws, and then, of course, no no memories, uh, single memories could. Uh, um, eliminated uh, a philosophy of history, of course not. But still, they mm, prohibited uh, some kind of uh, judgment about certain historical events that they became just s sacred uh, yeah, for special for some communities. Then, and it is uh, already long story. Yeah, but we just uh, need to o overthink it. I think. As for historians, I, I think the historians should um, not only research into history, but also to try to understand the processes in 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 cultures of, of history, of, of, of memory cultures, of using history. That was the, the starting point for, for for our research group, not to not to not to cry about about the society that are not hearing <laughs> to the historians, but to understand what are, the, what are the ways history is used to different, very, very different. There's not only, there's not only politics, uh, not only politics obviously, but very different ways history is used for very different individual and collective purposes and, and goals. And we have to, and that's the, and that's the field where historians are able to, deli to deliver a historical expertise on contemporary contemporary societal and cultural cultural processes so we have to research into that uh, and not not only to not only to to, re, to, to react to them to the to the, to the to the new processes as for the as for the new situation i generally i would not say that i could observe new general tendencies in the in in memory and memory cultures of course mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's, 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 uh, it's, there are, uh, there are partial new tendencies and phenomena if you, if you look on Ukrainian, his, uh, his, his culture of history, of, on Polish culture of history, you have new, even new contexts or new, 
categories or 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 or, or, or new ways of thinking of the history. An example is the is, is the new very new topic of decolonization decolonization of decolonizing Ukrainian history. How to decolonize history? But it's it's only <laughs> only a kind of transfer of. Of 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 logical and theoretical or or, or 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 logical categories used in other in other contexts for that have been used for 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 decades. Uh, emotions is very 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 important. It's very important point because it's that politicians and other actors are uh, besides of historians are using history it's, it's new, new that it's new, not, not uh, new what was new in nineteen uh, history were the were the claims of historians to have to have to decisive the to decisive voice in this in the historical discourse so so sometimes i think maybe we are we are we are coming back to to, to historical normality that not historians uh, are, the, 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 the historians are not so important in historical. It's sad for me, of course, but <laughs> I, I'm not able to change this, this tendency. We can reflect on it, and we can we can analyze what that what what are the consequences. We are we have to discuss what does it means we mean for the for the future. But emotions, there is still there is still a very 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 uh, yeah a long. Uh, um, discussion, or I would even say argument about uh, historical reenactments. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only reenactments on the battlefields, but general, general way. How are they able uh, the reenactments to produce empathy with historical actors? And those the, the ones answers yes. It's it's the best way to to to, to produce. To bring the people to the idea, or, or to, the, to, 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 to the perspective, or to, 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 to an idea how historical actors had perceived their his, situation, their 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 uh, problems, historical crisis, and, and and so on. And the other ones says no. That even uh, reactions on the emotional emotional level prevent us from understanding history because we project our Modern or postmodern emotions to enter into into deep history, and that the, our emo emotions of today are have not to do with the emotions and and perspectives and perceptions and what is in German called Lebenswelten uh, of of the people that lived some uh, several centuries ago. Yeah. Only a, uh, one small remark uh, of mine. Um, uh, I, I th you spoke about uh, place, uh, 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 and I uh, will stress uh, the uh, um, the role of film as a vehicle uh, is joining the some knowledge with much uh, emotions, uh, and uh, um, I spoke about two films that that uh, are able to change uh, the mood in the. Uh, in the Polish-Ukrainian relations, I I think about the film "Meine, uh, meine <laughs> Unsere Mütter, Unsere Väter." Uh, the, uh, 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 it was the uh, uh, it was uh, 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 the, the, the Polish-German relations were uh, uh, really wor uh, uh, worsening uh, after the, that film or a film uh, Russian film uh, in the 90s about. I forget the title, uh, a historical film about the uh, mm, uh, uh, great Smuta and the uh, uh, um, liberation of Kremlin uh, from the Polish, uh, say, uh, from the po po Polish hands. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, very interesting film, uh, uh, it, it, critical scenes in, in Poland and so on. Uh, so. so only small. Uh, I, I'd like uh, to add some small. You are, you are speaking on films. You 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 have mentioned these ga computer games uh, by by the Czech developed by the Czech company. And I was addressed by reviewers because the games uh, have all, uh, uh, reviews 
too. And, and uh, a group of reviewers addressed me some five years ago because there was a new game developed by this Czech company. And there was a problem. The story of this game took place in medieval Bohemia, 13th century maybe. And the problem was that, there, that, that all the knights in the game were white. There were no one black Bohemian knight of the, uh, of, 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 of the 13th century. And that is what I meant by, by, by uh, retrotopic praxis, because, uh, because, because not the, the, the decisive point is not how is it was in the reality, but the decisive point is how we want to have it, right? how we want to have the, have the history. And maybe in this, in this point, the romantic wave, rom romantic wave of thinking on history is coming back. Not this is if it's the, 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 the true, nicht die Wahrheit der Fakten, not the true of, of, of facts, but the true of ideas. But romantics meant by ideas, romantics meant the spirit of the historical period. So, so Geschichtsgeist, no? Geist der Geschichte. And now we, the, the, our starting point is, is, is the spirit of our, of our, of, of our peri uh, period. That would be maybe the difference between uh, uh, retrotopical praxis and the romantical, uh, uh, the romantical usage of history. Romantic. Uh, just a little <coughs> remark about uh, uh, films. Uh, when uh, um, in Russia uh, in 20, 2010, uh, the film of uh, Vaida. Uh, cut in, uh, was a show in the TV. Uh, many Russian people uh, uh, learned uh, for the first time about this uh, event. Uh, although, although Russia recognized uh, officially the crime, uh, the Soviet crime, and now cutting is uh, uh, negated uh, again, or worse, uh, justified, justified. Uh, with uh, this argument that uh, um, Polish uh, Polish attitude uh, against the Russian uh, prisoners uh, in the Russian uh, Russian um, uh, Polish war uh, justify yes, justify the uh, cutting crime. So uh, uh, the action of the film was very strong, but not very long. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're running out of time, but if there is one, two questions from the public, I think we totally can. Oh. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bradley Reynolds from the University of Helsinki. Uh, this is a question for Milos Reznik. So thank you all for the presentations. Um, on this idea that you were talking about of if we can't form the future, then we form the past. So this is probably a much wider question, but it's the idea that um, if we think about um, imagined communities or the invention of tradition, can we say that the past has previously been used to kind of imagine a certain type of future? Uh, and then kind of this would be interesting to hear more about your postmodern perspective in if kind of the nation state is no longer this ideal modernity, then kind of do we need to find something else and what might that be? This is a very large question, but maybe I can follow up later. Thank you. And maybe another question, and then yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the fascinating talks. Uh, I, I have a lot of questions actually, but <laughs> but only only a few of them. Uh, well, first of all, the the question to uh, um, Mr. Uh, Riedel. Um, this um, incredible solidarity which we yet uh, have now uh, from the common people in Poland um, regarding Ukraine is uh, considered as a chance for, for both nations to uh, overcome this split, historical split, and now we have the discussion what to do with the history. And my question uh, is uh, what kind of uh, politics of history uh, would be effective? Here. It can be so 
oblivion, yeah, some some forgetting, some shifting from this all these questions. Uh, there was a, a tendency in Ukraine uh, recently that we uh, have too f too, too, too much too, too much history. Yeah, we, we, we should leave history to historians and and live with with the future. Yeah? Uh, or we have to to do something like police objectivity. Every every part can, can have right for their own own heroes. And so this is the question: what what to do with with such 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 kind of history? is a problematic history. Uh, the second question is to uh, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Dubina. Uh, um, my question, this, that is um, more or less clear what is the logic of, of, of um, Russian Russian government, of Putin, that, that, that are people uh, who were formed by 90s and in the 90s that revelation demoralized Soviet elite and Soviet society and it is considered uh, like like some danger for the for the uh, uh, state, for the Russian state and for the Putin's regime is in, and it was especially after this protest in Moscow so, so emphasized in in, in Russia uh, after t t 2012. Uh, but my question uh, is, was uh, what what is happening? Uh, so on the ground, from below, uh, why? Uh, so um, every uh, many many people say that uh, no one in the, in in the in the West uh, in Europe uh, know uh, know much about Ukraine. What is what Ukraine is? But I would say that no one have no idea what Russia is in, in, in Europe and in the West. Uh, and uh, my question is, is there something like reaction from below on this, 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 this uh, laws uh, uh, from the side of, of uh, history teachers, some solidarity action among historians? So, uh, but the, all the, 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 these examples with tanks on Berlin, it wasn't wasn't initiated only by uh, by the government in in Russia. Yeah, it, it was was supported uh, from the side of Russian society. How was was this reaction? And if I may, the the question the question to to to, to the Mr. Uh, Reznik. Uh, this is uh, yeah, important discussion. It was initiated by, by Pierre Nora, this relation between the uh, vision of future and, and the past. <laughs> but it's, uh, I'm wondering, uh, okay, we have, we have uh, every, every time we have the worse and worse uh, uh, the, the vision of the future, but my question is why, why the vision of the past is, is getting worse? Uh, Past. Or the past <laughs> at the same time, it's especially the, 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 the vision of American past, for example, it is getting e all so worse and worse. Uh, that is, yeah, and, and that's it. Thank you. So we collect any questions, or mm -hmm. if there's maybe one last question, okay. Frank Relke, uh, Polish Study uh, Institute for Interdisciplinary Polish Studies in Via Drina, Frankfurt Oder. I, I just was wondering why we historians are so reluctant to look at the beauty of history, as Milos Reznik said. We are like reluctant to use anthropo anthropological aspects and concepts in uh, our historical writing. Why do, I, and I read all of your papers as a kind of a um, statement for an alternative history, history to, to look at uh, solidarity, to look at charity, to look at mutual help, especially Jan, Jan, Jan Riedel mentioned. Why are we so reluctant to stress this factors? Polish uh, German uh, history over the last 50 years is, is determined by this discourse of reconciliation until today. Uh, is, is still de is determined by this uh, discourse of reconciliation until today, and it's, it might might be the same uh, the same way with with Ukrainian Polish relations in the future. So, what what, what the hell is the problem to write about the beauty of history, as M Milos Reznik said? Why are we still looking for the facts for what what the what the big powers are doing in the government? I don't know. Maybe one of you can answer to meet the question. So the first question was for me. Uh, um, I should. I, I think. Uh, I think, in contrary to Milos Resnik, uh, that uh, 
the historian, uh, the historians uh, have to a great role to play in in uh, historical policy, memory po po policy. It is. Uh, um, uh, so to say, only the historian could provide the uh, input in the uh, in the right direction. Uh, in the in the, uh, it, it, the the work his, of historian is uh, uh, is based on on source, sources and and uh, uh, the actual uh, state of knowledge about history is is the best possible. Uh, uh, so to say, a vision of history, and uh, if we uh, uh, can transmit this uh, actual uh, state of knowledge uh, uh, in the language of, of uh, uh, popular uh, uh, media, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, see that the, uh, uh, that the history uh, uh, has, uh, in the most cases, no uh, this uh, uh, explosive uh, uh, f f form or explosive wirkung, uh, action, uh, uh, and uh, um, it is Polish-German ex uh, experience. I, I would say, uh, uh, despite the problems of, of reparations <laughs> uh, from the last time. In the field of uh, uh, great field of Polish-German conflicts, historical conflicts, there are now only few discutable fields. Many things are uh, cleared, uh, and it is uh, uh, fully artificial to uh, to to to. Uh, 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 to repeat the, the old, now cleared uh, conflicts. Uh, so so I, it, is, it is the work of historian, the work of uh, Polish-German Historical Commission uh, for, for 40, 50 years and so on. So on. It's, it, it takes time, but, but it, it is the, probably the only uh, successful way. The question about Lowe's. Okay, I, I have only one question. Yeah, about uh, what's happening from below. You mean if it's some protest against this uh, memory laws in Russia? I understand you right, rightly, correctly. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course it was. Yeah. So, is it 2009 when this uh, criminal law, this criminal law um, against Nazis? Yeah. So this then was applied. Yeah, it was a great protest, and that's why there's uh, historians also uh, wrote the letters, and and actually in cabinet of ministers also people said against it. So they just put it on hold, and 2014. Just very, very quickly uh, um, make a new law. So it, so it happens in Russia. We have a lot of protests. Now you, you're not supposed to protest anymore on, on the streets, yeah, because uh, we, it's forbidden uh, to make any protests in the streets. Uh, also, if you're staying alone and protest. You can write letters still. It, it, it's possible, yeah. But, I mean... And we just probably missed the time, or just was the forces was not so equal. <laughs> uh, that's why it's uh, it, it, uh, or protest again. Idini uh, Uchepnik. That's the only history book, for example. Never come uh, to to schools. That's the only history book. Yeah, it was a great protest, huge protest among historians and not only historians and human rights people. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's teachers of history. Yes, of course. It is, it, it, now they people now protesting so they they could. Yeah, so it's a silent protest. Yeah, they put a uh, or, oral book on 1984. Yeah, 84. Yeah, in in a, in a vitrine. Uh, that's to show that we are against this. Yeah, because they no, it's no open protest possible uh, uh, in Russian law system now. So that's a protest that they could, or just live in Russia because of this war. It's also one protest. Maybe I can add that the, the, uh, the main association uh, uh, which uh, 
carried this protest uh, memorial association was uh, dissolved uh, so uh, they cannot protest uh, now they can but from from abroad the classical modern model was was the idea that there is a logical connection between past present and and future so so the the the, the history in, in the historicism the, the particular was historicism was a function of futurism you you need the 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 history to tell the story that should uh, that should be continued continued on in 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 a certain form or in a certain certain direction and and that this on this logical connection collapsed a little bit in 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 last decade so so at this point past future <laughs> past present and we are we are looking partly back to past because what was the reason for for the, for this for this collapse of, of of future visions maybe i would think it's 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 emo, uh, emo. less and less possible to predict the future is less and less predictable or seems to be less and less predictable we are surprised every every 3 years by developments that we have not expected the war in ukraine the pandemics the migration crisis the and 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 so on so on so we, we so, so 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 we and and on again this background please please notice that for for some 30 years we have a kind of endism in european culture we are still speaking of the not only for koyama after 1980 1989 but at the latest with 2000 with with 911 every Two or three years, we used to say uh, the world will, will never, uh, never more be as we now know it. That's, that's the end of our world. Uh, this is uh, uh, that was the case after pandemics. That was the case during the migration crisis. That is the case now. And and every 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 uh, uh, couple of years, we repeat this, and are 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 convinced that that we are living and in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a turning point of history where something ends and we don't know what <laughs> what what starts that, that it's the one thing uh, of course you have a you have different uh, the his, this the history is, is not only beauty uh, uh, beautiful but but you but, but you still in postmodern times you still can have a you can enjoy the history. You can have a lot of fun with history through reenactments, through through films, through through literature, combination of fantasy and historical fiction, and uh, and and so on, so on. Games are mentioned. Uh, games, tourism, tourism. You can, you're making fun with with history through through through, through tourism. It's 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 very it's very important tendency in the last three decades. The, the role of heritage, history, authenticity in the in, in in the tourism. I agree completely with you. I agree completely. I'm very normative. I'm a very normative historian, and I would say historians are very important and shall de sh should decide or or or, or have a, a very important voice. But the problem is, and that what that is what we probably can't change. Uh, a large, large part of society, of public, of politicians don't accept this role. They don't. They don't acknowledge the, the role of his historians. That partly they can use it. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't say that that is uh, without any uh, importance in the in the debate, but, but the but but the society today. For the society today, the historiography, the academic historiography, is only one of the many sources of what is called historical, mm. or, or what they call historical, <laughs> historical knowledge, and that's, I, I think that's good. But we we should take into account we 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 are very limited in our possibilities to change this this tendency. But that even that's. Is a historical tendency, tendency of our days. Maybe I 
I forgot now. I forgot now. Some, 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 some questions, but the time, yes. The time's out. The time's running to the left. I guess this would be a, perhaps the first, but not very optimistic conclusion of this of this panel and this conference. Uh, thank you so very much to all the speakers. And we've got like 15 minutes, is it? 10 minutes left for a coffee break. 30 minutes in program, but not so, yeah, yeah. 15 minutes. 15 minutes break. Thank you so very much. So, we can start the second, second section of our conference and there are some organizational remarks. We, the, there, is a, the, there is a paper less, but we have also less time for that. So, so I, I would like to, to, to ask you to, to limit your presentation it's to... Ten <laughs> 10 minutes not 50, after 15 minutes i will i will i will may uh, i i shall make a sign and then you have some 2 or 3 minutes to sum up at the maximum and we have to leave anyway at 17 as scheduled in the in the program um as for the second paper by uh, by miss kuchinkova from brno Unfortunately, she was not able to join us in person today, and so she sent in a, uh, 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 yes, a presentation that's printed here, available, disponible for you. You can take a copy, and so we have started the first one. The speak is. Uh, Mikola Borovic, coming today from Frankenberg in Saxony. It's not far from Chemnitz. No, it's in surroundings of Chemnitz. Uh, that was the town where Barkas was produced in the Judea time, but it's only for uh, people that can <laughs> remember the times. Um, uh, Mikola. Uh, 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 Mikola Borovic is from Kiev. He, he had several positions at the Kiev Academy of Science and at uh, above all in the in the uh, Shevchenko it's National the University of of Kiev. He's dealing with the history of 20th century, with the wars, uh, with Holocaust, with memory of the of the wars. He wrote. Uh, parts of book, a history of Ukraine and Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, Ukraine in the, the time second, of the Second World War. But both books are in Ukrainian language. And excuse me, I have the glasses and can't breathe. And uh, the the subject of the paper is unexpected war and unmastered un in brackets, past politics of memory in German-Ukrainian relations in the face of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind of, uh, presentation and for the invitation, which was a stimulus for me uh, to uh, organize, uh, to systematize, systematize my thoughts uh, to the relations between uh, politics of memory and current events. Uh, theoretically thinking, um, this uh, war has become a real test for many theoretical c concepts um, uh, which uh, formed the methodological basis of memory studies until recently. From my personal research perspective, the problem of the relationship between official narratives and uh, the so-called grassroots uh, memory is particularly, particularly interesting, especially in terms of their influence on uh, political attitudes and uh, group identities. In this con context, uh, the case of German-Ukrainian relations uh, or the German case in, in its relation to Ukraine in comparative perspective 
uh, seems particularly interesting to me. First of all, due to the role that was and is given to uh, the politics of memory in Germany, in this country, recognition of the historical responsibility for the crimes of the Nazis, especially for the Holocaust, became not only a core of a culture of remembrance, uh, but also a guiding principle of practical politics at the same time, or at least was, was declared to be so. Uh, the admission of guilt, uh, historical guilt meant or should have meant acceptance of responsibility for the preventing such crimes and first of all for the, uh, of, of the crime genocide in the future. Moreover, uh, by making a radical break with the past and condemning their crimes, um, the Germans even gained some sense of superiority uh, over societies that failed to do so. Uh, such societies are perceived or, or were perceived, maybe until now, as backward, as those who, who need to be taught, who need to be helped and taught. Uh, this task uh, concerned mainly Eastern Europe, but not Russia, of course. Uh, if we look at the German studies on the politics of memory, or maybe might not, not better, uh, the uh, conferences to this topic from the recent, uh, recent years, um, my impression is they mostly look like a pair of front cases. What is wrong with uh, politics of memory in Lithuania, in, in Poland, in Ukraine, in Hungary, in comparison to German one? Uh, I remember how at one of the conferences in Kyiv, a German political scientist, actually a big friend of Ukraine and one of the, 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 the best uh, experts in this country, directly said that Ukraine will not be able to join the European Union uh, until it stops glorifying nationalists. Uh, this very ability to build uh, the culture of memory compatible with the exemplary Do German one was seen as one of the main conditions for the European perspective of Ukraine, and not only in Germany, but, but uh, in, by, by many people in Ukraine as well, by, by me to a great extent. And now I ask myself, what is a real condition, so a real, so... Uh, so, sp speaking, uh, the door to Europe for Ukraine. I mean, uh, in the case of Ukraine not becoming a victim of brutal Russian aggression. And uh, I also think a lot about the question of whether Ukraine would have been able to fight and survive uh, at all if it had implemented such a politics of memory. In reality, Ukraine had a different uh, historical experience and different goals. Uh, if in Germany the task was to prevent the revival of nationalism, Ukraine, on the contrary, uh, in the last 30 years has been engaged in the construction of a nation, the na national identity. Uh, it is important to note that in the specific situation of Russian neighborhood, maintaining national independence was for Ukraine a condition for the preservation of human rights and democracy at the same time. The main pillars of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's official, Ukrainians' official politics of memory have been the Great Famine 1933, uh, known in Ukraine as the Holodomor, which was officially uh, treated as a genocide against the Ukrainian people, or the Ukrainian nation, and to, to a lesser extent the Chernobyl disaster, both tragedies uh, meant, uh, meant to demonstrate the consequences of Russian imperial domination and the price of statelessness. In parallel with the narrative of victimhood, the Ukrainian politics of memory also tried to build a heroic narrative of the national liberation struggle. The so narrative was something like uh, we should uh, remember the victims of the past, but we should fight uh, in order to prevent the, the repeating of these tragedies in the future. And we have good examples for that in our uh, history. Uh, and uh, Ukrainian uh, official heroic pantheon looked quite colorful and eclectic. Uh, it includes princes of ancient truth, the Parisian Cossacks, uh, Red Army soldiers and soldiers of other armies, uh, natives of Ukraine who fought against Nazism. In Germany, however, such eclectic eclecticism usually fell out of the public eye. The focus of interest uh, in Ukraine was the topic of Ukrainian collaboration with the Nazis and uh, Ukrainian nationalism, especially the problem of glorification of organization of Ukrainian nationalism, so-called Bandera Kalpen. 
other such things. Uh, it is very difficult to say what, what role uh, such a politics of memory has played in the determination of Ukrainians to defend their country now. Ukrainians are definitely fighting for their future, not for their past, as, as Russians do. Uh, at the same time, the past and memory certainly matter here, but uh, it seems to me that living family memories have been a much, a much more effective factor than officially supported narratives. Just two examples regarding this, this war. From the very uh, first days of the war, Ukrainian officials, uh, uh, public intellectuals, offered a description of the war as a patriotic war. And it started from 2014, maybe, uh, now uh, especially present. And the hist hist uh, historian Yaroslav Hrycak uh, explicitly said that in this way he would hope to gain the support of the people for whom the Soviet discourse of great patriotic war is still important to close. But judging at least by the content of social networks, I can say that this, this concept has not gained wide support regarding this war in Ukraine now. And uh, it is not surprising for me, based on my own research, I can say that the vast majority of, uh, vast majority of the Ukrainians at the level of personal or family memories have never perceived World War II as a, a patriotic exploit, uh, mostly rather as a great misfortune, as a tragedy into which they were dragged by the wheel of fate. At the same time, uh, the qualification, and the same story is with the with, with, uh, term uh, Rashist and Rashism in Ukraine. It is uh, officially supported very actively by Ukrainian war propaganda, mostly maybe aimed at the influence of the, the Western audit, uh, audience, but in Ukraine, uh, on the so to some grass, grassroots level, isn't, isn't widely supported. Uh, at the same time, the qualification of the, of the war as a genocidal against the Ukrainian nation immediately found very broad popular support. And, and the, uh, the memory about the Holodomor is obviously at play here. Uh, the horrible stories about the famine of 1933 and about Soviet repressions in general live in almost every Ukrainian family. And uh, it may be one of the most influential factors in the determination of Ukrainians to resist the Russian occupation. As one of my former students said, going at, as a volunteer to the front in the first days after the Russian attack, I quote, I know what Russia is, and I would rather die in the field with a weapon in my hands than kneeling near a Russian explo uh, execution pit. Uh, the pictures uh, that opened to us in the liberated Ukrainian cities show us how right he was. Paradoxically enough, a similar trend can be observed in Germany as well. According to, uh, according to my observation, the influence of the officially supported politics of memory on practical po political decisions and political attitudes in this country, in this context, in the context of this war, was surprisingly low. It is very telling that, for example, the political party that most vocally supported the, the famous Vergangen uh, Heisbewältigung, that is mastering of the past in Germany, uh, the left party, Die Linke, and the party that opposed it, the alternative for, for Germany, the right party, took virtually the same position on Ukraine in, 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 this, in, in this war. And uh, maybe the, the, the more telling example, the difference in position between in Green Party and Social Democrat. Both both parties supported this, this, this politics very actively, intellectual organization. So, and now, now they, they, they have quite different position regard, regarding to my opinion, weapons for Ukraine, for Ukraine and so on and so far. Uh, it is also striking that in the discourse of the mainstream media and the parties of the political center, the topic of German, German historical responsibility has either disappeared altogether or, 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 or been marginalized. It is noteworthy uh, that the most iconic figures of the discourse known as Vergangenheitsbewältigung, such as Jürgen Habermas or Harald Welzer, have refused to take sides in this war at all. Their position sounds like this, uh, Russia's aggression, aggression is terrible uh, and the Russians are committing a crime, but leave us out of this. We, uh, whatever happens, we do not want to be a part of this conflict. 
The discursive strategy used to justify the desire to stay out of this war is also very revealing. As historical, uh, historian Felix Ackermann puts it, German side uh, the war experiences of their own fathers and grandfathers, soldiers and officers of the Wehrmacht uh, in many cases, to demand negotiations with today's aggressor. Professor Welzer, to whose example Ackermann refers uh, among others, has written so much and so well about the reversal of the victim-perpetrator perspective in German memories of, of the war and the Holocaust. And now he is doing exactly the same thing himself. Uh, this issue should uh, certainly still be carefully researched, but preliminary, uh, pre 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 preliminary, I have to agree with historian Stefan Scholz's conclusion that the main lesson that uh, the Germans actually learned from the lost war was simply never to fight again. No matter for what sake, just not to fight. This can explain why so many Germans are ready to help Ukrainian refugees, millions of them, but are not ready to help the Ukrainian army. And uh, another important point that catches the eye, very often Germans who are willing to help refugees from Ukraine mention their family experience, experience of German expulsion from Eastern Europe as a ground for that. And this is exactly the memory that the official German politics of memory considered undesirable and tried to construct because it was believed as to, to, to relativize the weight of the crimes of Nazism, to revive the revanchism in Germany, and so on and so far. It seems to me that the dominant per perspective uh, regarding the past, which is adopted by the most Germans, is the perspective of a victim. This is precisely uh, what the German mastering of the past was supposed to work overcome. Maybe it can explain the paradox in the German reaction to the Russian aggression that was the most incompre incomprehensible for me. Almost no one, from ordinary people, ordinary Germans, to the leading politicians, is willing to lay the guilt for the war on ordin ordinary Russians. After so many talks about the dictatorship of consent, uh, about the complicity and corresponsibility of Germans in the war crimes of Nazism, Germans are still not ready to accept the, the idea that not only Putin can be responsible for current war. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, obviously the events of the last few months are forcing us to rethink many things that until now uh, seemed self-evident. This also applies to the role of the past in the memory and memory. After decades of memorial boom, uh, we have to state that possibilities of memory politics have been greatly over overestimated. We can see that the living family memory, which is passed down from generation to generation, can be extremely persistent, especially if it resists officially supported narratives. Nevertheless, despite, despite all my skepticism, I will say that the politics of memory matter. I am convinced that for those millions of, and millions of Germans who, who uh, despite the fear of war, are not afraid to face the challenge of aggressors and dictators, who do so because they feel empathy, empathy, uh, empathy for the victims, because they feel part of the free world, they have become such also thanks to the knowledge of the past. The same can be said about millions of Ukrainians who are now defending not only their own country, but it so happened, uh, the whole democratic world. But the politics of memory works if it works through more subtle psychological mechanisms and the result of our efforts in this direction is never guaranteed. Nevertheless, this is not the reason to do nothing, rather opposite is true. And it is obvious a reason for us to study these mechanisms further. Thank you for your attention. If you have 15 minutes and five seconds. So, uh, let us proceed further. The next one is Bradley Reynolds from the University of Helsinki, 
Rosie Reynolds is doctoral researcher at the University in Political Sciences. He deals with 1990s security policy, security discourse in, in the European Union with Finnish and Russian foreign policies with OECD. He also has studied Russian language in Kazan. And the title you can see already on the screen. So the floor is yours. Thank you. So first I want to say thank you to uh, Ulrich Duma for the invitation. Um, I'm a doctoral researcher from the University of Helsinki. And I just wanted to say that we have uh, um, I just was elected to the Board of Historians Without Borders, which is the Finnish equivalent of these um, kind of memory politics discussions. So I think it's very nice that we're, there are these epistemic communities discussing contemporary politics. And we have a parallel event in Berlin next week with the Frederick um, Eiften Stiftung on uh, the similar topic. So the use and abuse of history in the Ukrainian conflict. Um, and if anyone is interested in information on that, I'd be glad to uh, forward it. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about Finnish NATO membership and memory politics, which Russia to remember. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk a bit about temporal moments in history um, and use examples to show how temporal moments following February 24th influence memory politics and foreign policy, and then memory politics and public space. So kind of the two levels on memory politics and foreign policy and then in public debate. Um, I'll use the end of the Cold War as a first example of kind of this template of unfreezing of history, and then kind of think about February 24th and the period after as an example of memory and security policy, and the NATO debate in Finland as a second example. And then for the public debate, then I'll kind of think about the connections of does Lenin live in Finland, and kind of how um, statues of memorializing this Finnish-Russian relationship have also become a point of debate and then kind of points on future research. So as a caveat, this is not, um, this is so contemporary, I'm kind of offering some reflection and um, thoughts for future research. So, um, as a theoretical frame for memory and foreign policy, Jennifer Dixon argues that in times of significant upheaval and uncertainty uh, and possibilities for change create domestic and international environments ripe for renegotiations of history culture, what she calls the unfreezing of history. Christopher Browning argues that temporal periods of upheaval, upheaval increase opportunity to appropriate the truth uh, of history for specific political agendas. Mm, and kind of the first example is, of course, uh, the end of the Cold War. And we saw this a lot in this return to Europe uh, narrative or the common European home, kind of these debates, which have been researched from kind of the perspective of memory policy. So in Finland, there was this idea of the image of Finland in year zero. So there was a publication from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1991, and it kind of promoted this idea that history was starting over as Finland returned to Europe. So kind of associating with these larger trends, these transnational history cultures. Um, in the early 1990s, there was large historical revisionism, an attempt to break away from old post-war Finnish identities in favor of reconstructing Western identity. Uh, for the nation. This was similar to memory politics, uh, political trends seen in other European countries that we saw, that we talked about, this return to Europe. Uh, this revisionism also paralleled a critical assessment of Finland's Cold War foreign policy, and many people began to argue that too much sovereignty was given up to the Soviets. Uh, this is the idea of kind of a reassessment of Finlandization or President Kekkonen's policies that had kept Finland from its true Western essence. And just very briefly, this idea of Finlandization uh, there's, this is a large field of research as well, and it's the idea that domestic and foreign policy uh, is made with consideration of what Moscow would want. And this can be used as an ideal type, or it can be used for the Finnish uh, situation specifically. But in general, it's a very emotional topic, and in Finnish politics, usually it's used to discredit opponents still today. Um, so this revisionism brought up uh, the debate of Russia as a critical piece of Finnish identity and foreign policy formation. For example, Marko Antonozic uh, argued that by joining the EU, the Finns were above all espousing a European Western identity as a means of marking their separation from a Russian Eastern identity. 
And Christopher Browning also argued that Russia, repre Russia representing instability and disorder was a key reference point of, of Finnish identity and foreign policy. So therefore, EU membership was used as a validation of Finland's true European nature. But Browning kind of questioned this in 2002, asking, was this really coming home, or was this more moving home? Uh, so Browning argued, quote, the politicized nature of such essentializing narrative uh, posited the existence of an organic, natural, and effervescent Western identity for Finland. Finns have had prior national identities distinct from the purely Western identification, which have felt equally as real and natural, but which have relied on different stories of the self and for justification. Finnish Cold War identities of neutrality and of Finland as a bridge between East and West were just as real as post-Cold War Western ones." Uh, end quote. Thus, rather than coming home to the West, Finland was actually undergoing an identity transformation, and Browning argued it was in fact moving home. So this is kind of in the Finnish debate, kind of how this was separated from the other examples of uh, Warsaw Pact countries who use these memory politics. And then despite these essentializing narratives and uh, denunci denunciations of Finland's past relations with the Soviet Union, there are still many markers of this Finnish-Soviet relationship in public space. So kind of this is the idea we have here, Westerners with Soviet, Soviet statues. After the Cold War, many markers of this Finnish-Soviet relationship remained in public space. And even in 2008, Joni Krekola uh, asserted that the Finns have remained relatively indifferent to their own surroundings. The few monuments and places that were dedicated to Lenin have mostly been allowed to rest in peace. Um, and this idea highlighted the different memories and identities that had uh, existed and continued to exist in Finnish society not only these essentializing narratives about Russia and the West that were used in this high political level. Mm, and we have these statues here. This is the World Peace statue, which is in Helsinki, and kind of this is the last this, a statue of Lenin in Kotka, which I will return to. So we have temporal moment number two, this idea of kind of memory politics coming back uh, post-February 24th in Finland. And kind of this is the idea is it's coming home or moving home 2.0. Uh, various Finnish politicians uh, have argued that Finland joining NATO represents the final step in affirming Finland's Western identity. So kind of if we think about EU as being a validation of Finland's Western identity, still there's this need to say NATO is making us even more Western. So thinking about that in terms of identity politics. And now the reassessment rather than the Cold War history is now the reassessment of why did Finland not join NATO in the 1990s? And so kind of thinking about these historical debates there. Um, a piece of this was the eternal question of Finland's foreign policy, which is when to move. Uh, it is important to make sure for Finnish security elite that their security policy initiatives will be successful beforehand, so as not to decrease security by showing their hand too early. Uh, this was the mentality with the EU membership. For example, Finnish President Koivisto at the time, uh, EU membership was mainly a security policy, and if Finland was not allowed to join, it would be decreasing its uh, security. Because Russia would know that Finland wanted to move west and couldn't. These memories arose in the Finnish NATO debate for Finnish security policy elites, and um, specifically in relation to Russia, but also in relation to Sweden. So kind of to look at the Swedish example, we can look at this newspaper cover here on the right, which occurred in May 2022, and when Finnish NATO membership became more or less likely. Um, and you can see in the picture, there's uh, two men, a Finnish and a Swedish rower, rowing towards this star on the horizon, which is the NATO uh, logo, away from this uh, ship with the Russian military star. Mm, and it says, Sama Tahtia, which means at the same rate. Mm, so this was the symbolism uh, because Finnish political elite had bad memories from the EU membership application when Finland thought Sweden would leave an EU uh, would, would apply for EU membership at the same time as the Finns. But at the last moment, Stockholm decided not to apply. And Helsinki felt betrayed and it upset the relationship, however, only momentarily. But, however, but these memories remained. Um, 
if the, uh, in the NATO application, Finland wanted to use this unfreezing of history to present itself as the responsible partner and change the traditional paradigm of Sweden being the older brother and uh, Finland kind of assuming that position momentarily. So you have these various layers of memory politics in Finnish, Finnish NATO membership, not only of Russia, but also of Sweden as well, and kind of this attempt to act out new relationships as history unfreezes. So then moving down to the public level, you have uh, the question of these foreign policy memories and their influence on public perceptions. Because if you followed the Finnish NATO debate, a large piece of this was the validation of the change in Finnish uh, public perceptions from somewhere around 20 to 30% in support to 60 to 70%. Uh, Finnish NATO membership has been labeled as a triumph for democracy by Finnish President Niinisto in August 2002. Um, in the academic community, however, you had Ole Waver and Thomas Forsberry, who had a debate on this issue already in May 2022. And kind of the debate was over, was public support for NATO membership elite-led or an elite response to a shift in public perceptions? Um, so the question was if elite attempts to shape memory politics and foreign policy discussions and in public debate influence the shift from the 20 to 30 percent to 60 to 7 percent percent of support for NATO. And of course, this is a point of a larger debate in IR of how much public perceptions influence foreign policy. So the Finnish NATO debate in this sense was an interesting process to watch develop in real time. And there's not been uh, sufficient scientific research on this topic yet, but there are various uh, projects beginning at the University of Helsinki to kind of think about these points. And for example, just to kind of the research that has been done on the NATO debate in Finland, uh, Iro Sarko has argued that Finnish parliamentarians have already been open to Finnish NATO membership uh, over the past decade, while public opinion has largely remained in that 20 to 30 percent range. So thinking about this, uh, does Lenin still live in Finland? Because this Krekola article in 2008 his title was "Does Lenin Still?" Uh, or his article, his title was "Lenin Still Lives in Finland," kind of saying that the Finns are indifferent to these these uh, statues and Lux de Memoir. So, kind of Pierre Noir's uh, Lux de Memoir and Memory Reserves is useful to consider the rise of protests over how Russia is remembered in public space in Finland. Change in politics and Finland's position towards Russia allowed previous memories that lay dormant or previously considered unpalatable to arise. As the foundation of good relations with Russia, as a premise for Finnish porn, foreign policy, more or less died in spring 2022, these old parameters of norms of discussing Russia in politics and in public memory seem to slowly dissipate. So I'm gonna, I'll offer a few examples here. So we have the Lenin statue I showed in Kotka. That was the last Lenin statue in Finland and it was taken down finally uh, in October 2022. And then we have the World Peace statue here, and you can see its difference. So it's one of the most impressive statues of socialist realism in Helsinki, and it was presented as a gift from the city of Moscow in 1990, three months after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and it was a compromise with the Soviets because they wanted it to be a Lenin statue, and kind of the Finns got them to only offer this World Peace statue. Um, the only previous instant of defamation was in 1991, when a group of students covered the statue with tar and feathers, and it was subsequently cleaned. Uh, new defacement occurred after February 24th, and you, um, you can kind of see a bit here, the statue's name, World Peace, was spray painted over with the, world, with the words World Brawl in Finnish. And then Ukrainian flags were draped around the statue and two placards were put up saying, stop Putin and F. Putin, with a picture of Putin shooting himself in the head. Uh, debate also became popular because the area was undergoing construction, uh, so there was a question of what to do with the statue after construction. Many people on social media said that it should be sent to the bottom of the sea, or at least placed in storage to never be seen again. Uh, significantly, director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs commented, as a Helsinki resident, my position is quite clear, gift of a genocidal empire. For the leaders of the Soviet Union, peace meant war. So debates on the statue's future in public space also became a lodestar for considering how the Soviet Union should be remembered and by association 
This had implications for the debate on Finland's role during the Cold War and also the NATO membership debate, the meaning of Russia and how Russia was to be remembered. And it was eventually moved to storage in August 2022. There's been no decision made on if it will return. Uh, so we'll have to check in to see how that happens in the future. Then we have uh, the story of street art and graffiti as a second example. Uh, originally, state-sanctioned areas for street art uh, kind of allowed this emergence of grassroots sentiment to appear. Uh, for example, in March-April, this picture here of No Putin, No War painting appeared in a bike tunnel uh, next to the parliament. And then there was another graffiti that appeared on the Russian Center of Science and Culture that said, Russian culture equals rape and torture. So both of these paint paintings uh, were covered over in about a week to be back to their original status. However, a few weeks later, in the same spot as the No Putin, No War painting, the picture of Putin as a puppeteer over the Ukrainian flag appeared, and it was allowed to stay. After the Kerch Bridge bombing in October and the retaliation of Russia on civilian inf infrastructure with missiles, the picture of Putin was changed to show blood on his fingers and face with new words saying, F Russia, in English and in Finnish. And then a week later, Russia was crossed out in bright green spray paint to read Putin. So kind of if we're thinking about these essentialist narratives. Uh, so therefore, kind of the idea here is that public space that were previously strictly monitored and ma maintained now allowed, are now allowed to exhibit public ex expressions uh, against Russia's war of aggression. New layers of memory allow to be added from a grassroots level. This existing and new Lux de Memoir are being layered through practice, public outcries, and everyday remembering, forcing administrative policies to change due to what seemed to be public demand. Uh, and kind of the whole main idea here is that Finns are not indifferent to these markers of the post-Soviet Finnish relationship as once thought and maybe a possible indicator of the ongoing need for Finnish society to publicly come to terms with the legacy of the Finnish-Soviet relationship. So in conclusion, uh, there's this idea that collective memory formed in interactions with foreign societies. Only after being shaped as foreign policy strategies does collective memory travel to domestic politics and become part of a society's collective identity. And this is from Catherine Bachlanter. So this is the idea of, we have a lot of this discussion on transnational memory culture in the post-Cold War period, and it will be also interesting to kind of reassess and compare to transnational memory cultures in this post-February 24th uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was very interested in expecting your considerations because I can remember that during the access process in the Czech Republic or, 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 or in Poland, the uh, argument as well, so using historical arguments was, was, was partly crucial. So, so, so the, the, the necessity of access out of historian experience, that was one of the central, central points of the argumentation. But we should, we should proceed further. Olaf Liewig is a researcher at the, uh, at, at the Estonian, Estonian Memory uh, Institute. He studied history in Tartu. His research fields are political history of Estonia, especially the second half of the, of the 20th century, but also German Baltic minority in the interwar period, his publications are dedicated to the Estonian uh, Communist Party uh, after the war. Yeah. And your topic today is Estonian perception of Russia and ethnic Russians from the history to the present day. 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, as I'm a historian, um, I make uh, long uh, excursion to history. I must say that um, during the uh, last hundred years, um, historical memory of Estonians and uh, image of Russians and, uh, Russian and ethnic Russians um, have considerably uh, changed, even dramatically changed in Estonia. When Estonia, or territory of Estonia, uh, became a part of the uh, Russian Empire, 
it's happened already uh, more than uh, uh, three centuries ago after the uh, defeat of the uh, Kingdom of Sweden in the Great Nordic War. Uh, Estonians uh, were uh, not actors of history, but objects, because uh, rulers or uh, upper uh, class in Estonia were that time Germans, called Baltic Germans. And Estonians were peasants or a, a country walk. And uh, so they were um, oppressed by, by German landlords. Uh, but uh, if you uh, uh, saw um, the map of, of uh, 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 <laughs> Polish Empire, so there were also uh, Baltic provinces, uh, Curonia, Livonia, and Estonia. And so they formed uh, at the beginning of, uh, uh, from the beginning of the 18th century, so-called uh, uh, Russian uh, Baltic Sea provinces or, or German provinces, Deutsche Ostsee Provinzen. And uh, those uh, provinces enjoyed very, very broad uh, autonomy with uh, uh, German language, uh, um, uh, education, uh, uh, culture, church, and uh, in, in, uh, in Russia it was called uh, uh, Landestat. This was uh, very, very broad autonomy. And um, 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 at that time, uh, language of instruction in the Baltics were, were, uh, was German, of course. And uh, they enjoyed uh, privileges uh, donated to them uh, by different rulers. And uh, Estonians and also Latvians were uh, so-called lower class. And what was uh, very important in uh, later history, that um, Estonians and the Germans who would uh, uh, making social rising, they uh, became uh, Germans. Um, when when uh, national um, aspiration uh, awoke in, Esto uh, in, in Estonia and in Latvia, it's happened in uh, the 19th century, the Baltic Germans turned into the other, so they were the others. And, uh, and uh, uh, not only, but uh, Germans were also represented as national enemies of Estonians and Latvians, elaborated by journalists, writers, and especially by, by historians. Uh, and this was a reason uh, that uh, social status of Estonians and, and uh, Germans was so different, even that time. And um, ethnic and social conflicts uh, intermingled. Uh, but what about Russians? Russians' presence at that, at that time was um, minimal, I must say. Um, limited by military and uh, later uh, times also uh, 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 Russian bureaucracy. But um, um, at uh, the Russian elite there was, of course, a very small number of uh, Russian uh, merchants in small towns and uh, very small Russian uh, settlements, but they lived uh, isolated and uh, Estonians and Latvians encounters with Russians were minimal at that time. Um, actually, uh, this uh, attitude to Russians were uh, more or less uh, neutral. Without encounters, you, you can't imagine what these uh, uh, Russians means, actually. Under uh, Russification, uh, at the uh, uh, second part of the uh, uh, 19th century, um, of course, um, 
um, uh, uh, Estonian linguistic aspirations um, uh, suffered a, a lot of under uh, uh, under the, uh, Russification, uh, but uh, a lot of Estonians believed that this Russification uh, would uh, also um, uh, diminish uh, German positions and, and uh, influence in, in the society. And in, in, uh, actually, the, uh, this process lasted uh, very long time, but it, uh, it was true, these this, uh, this, uh, exceptions, actually. Um, the situation uh, didn't uh, change a lot after the collapse of the uh, Russian Empire. Uh, size of power by Bolsheviks and, uh, and disintegration of the Russian Empire. Um, even an uh, outbreak of uh, war between uh, Estonia and uh, Bolshevik Russia did not affect Estonians' attitude to, to, to Russia in a negative way. Um, inside of Estonia, uh, there was um, sympathy uh, for the Bolsheviks. Bolsheviks uh, were different uh, from, from Baltic Germans, conservative uh, circles. And um, uh, uh, in the war against Russia, there was um, uh, Estonian unions actually um, on our side of front. Of course, uh, uh, one of them uh, fighting for Estonia and another for, for communism or, or communist Russia. Uh, uh, the second um, uh, explanation is Estonian elite. Um, so they were educated in Russian language and uh, in Russian schools and universities, and so, uh, so they esteemed the Russian language and culture. But uh, at the same time, as they despised the uh, uh, Soviet communism. And uh, um, um, another explanation is that a lot of Estonians and outside Estonia believed that uh, a Bolshevik regime would survive. But uh, on, on uh, our side, also in Estonia, where a lot of people thought that the uh, newly established Estonian state would have future. This was a very uh, controversial uh, attitude at that time. Um, uh, Estonia has um, about uh, one million uh, uh, inhabitants at that time, and um, um, about um, 10% of uh, inhabitants of Estonia were Russians at that time. And um, uh, is it also remarkable that um, only part of the uh, Russian minority admired at that time uh, uh, communist Russia? Our, our, our uh, were uh, indifferent and, uh, and um, um, uh, Russian elite or educated people uh, dreamed about rebirth of Russian Empire, uh, or at least uh, Russian Republic without uh, Bolsheviks. Um, uh, what about Estonians? Estonians uh, had at that time more or less uh, neutral attitude uh, uh, towards Russian minority or looked down on them. Uh, because uh, uh, Russians that time, uh, after the uh, peace treaty of Tartu, there was a lo lot of uh, Russian uh, peasants at the borderlands, and they were poorer and uh, less educated than Estonians. And uh, there was also a um, uh, Russian elite emigrated from Russia, but they were even treated by Estonians with uh, respect or feared because uh, um, of danger that the Russian Empire would be restored. Um, 
in in the 30s when uh, uh, Estonians had to compare uh, so-called two evils uh, 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 Nazi Germany and Stalinist uh, Russia. Um, uh, they uh, quite unanimously found that uh, uh, Russia would be lesser danger. This was because of the uh, uh, presence of a Baltic German minority. They were still in Estonia, very powerful, uh, without having uh, political privileges. So they were economically uh, very powerful. And uh, still, this time, uh, image of uh, uh, national enemy was was German at that time. Um, and um, 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 according to the secret protocol uh, of, of uh, 1939, uh, so-called uh, Hitler-Stalin pact, Estonia fell to Soviet uh, sphere of influence. And the result of that, Moscow gave Estonia an ultimatum and stationed uh, Russian troops in Estonia thereafter. Um, and uh, less than a year uh, later, uh, an action um, followed, and Estonia was incorporated to the uh, uh, Soviet Union as a, uh, uh, one part of the Soviet Union, uh, as a Union Republic with very, very limited uh, autonomy, uh, especially uh, in the cultural sphere. But uh, already uh, one, uh, uh, one year later, uh, if uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, um, attitude to, to Russia and ethnic Russians uh, very, very dramatically changed, and from, from neutral position become to, to hostile uh, position to Russians. Um, uh, of course, uh, this, uh, this uh, happened not, not uh, very strategically, but, but uh, Estonians, uh, most of Estonians, annoyed um, the course of Sovietization and, and, and the brutal uh, the terror and the violence, uh, which was already before the outbreak of a war with, with uh, Germany. And uh, the second very, very uh, important um, uh, issue in the later decades under the Russian rule was migration, uh, which was very, very extremely high um, uh, uh, in the 40s and in the 50s. And uh, as a result of um, migration to Estonia, from, from, uh, especially from Russia uh, and uh, our uh, republics, um, uh, a number of uh, Russians increased by one third of the population. But if we uh, take consider consideration also uh, uh, Russian-speaking uh, population, uh, as that time Belarus and Ukrainians, uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, Russian-speaking uh, population reached up to 40 percent. And this was a real problem for Estonians. And uh, of course, uh, um, uh, most sophisticated uh, uh, few to the, uh, uh, to the Russians were um, uh, made by, by, by uh, Russian's promotion. Uh, in, uh, and uh, um, uh, it was uh, also extended use of uh, Russian language in the everyday, in the everyday life, which uh, was um, um, uh, annoyed by Estonians, actually. And of course, um, uh, 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 Soviet party and state bureaucracy worked also in Russian language. Um, but uh, what is important to mention that uh, at that time was no, no violence, ethnic conflicts between uh, Russians and Estonians. So there were only so-called uh, 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 silent uh, opposition to, to Russians. And uh, uh, I must also mention, uh, notice that uh, um, Estonians 
were seen by, by Russian-speaking minority at that time also uh, as fascist. This was very common. And, uh, 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 but uh, Estonians depressed the uh, uh, Russian-speaking population mostly as uh, uh, rootless migrants. You know uh, also the notion uh, Homo Soveticus. Uh, this, is, uh, this was also very common at that time. And uh, this was a, a person spoke Russian, but uh, uh, neglected uh, his uh, national identity and uh, uh, culture. Um, uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Soviet, uh, uh, notion Soviet was uh, uh, understood uh, by Estonians as a Russian. And, uh, and uh, this was uh, for Estonians like a Russian, uh, ru a Russian rule or a Russian joke at that time. And some, some remarks uh, 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 nowadays, for nowadays Estonia. Um, uh, after the uh, restoration of yes, yes, um, uh, after the restoration of independence, uh, Estonia uh, ultimately we choose uh, Western orientation uh, without uh, making uh, any compromise in this regard, and uh, uh, joining with uh, NATO and EU in uh, 2004 um, have strengthened considerable Estonian security, but uh, uh, it, didn't, it didn't mean that uh, 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 Estonian uh, uh, relations between uh, ethnic Estonians and uh, ethnic Russians are uh, 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 considerably uh, improved, actually. Um, uh, it, uh, maybe it happened uh, uh, only uh, after the outbreak of uh, uh, Ukraine war. But uh, very last note is that um, when Estonia parliament uh, declared uh, Russia as um, uh, a terrorist regime, um, uh, 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 Russian-speaking uh, parliament members uh, uh, remain uh, mostly neutral position. Uh, so he uh, didn't want to condemn uh, Russian war in, in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So you, we had three quite different topics in this uh, in this section so we we had to pull, uh, we had the german so so the german memory context of the war of the current war we had finished ah, this, it wasn't so 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 difficult. excuse me finish discussion on, on on nato access in context of the war and we had an overview of the of the of the relation of Eto Estonians to the dominant ethnic groups in Estonia. There are some eighteen minutes left for the discussion. You are invited to ask the questions or to discuss or to comment because I forgotten to mention that we have that we have a kind of reception at half past Five, so we have to leave. Five. If not, if we are late, there will be no dinner. <laughs> so, Vera. I just have an information, very short question. Firstly, to Bradley Reynolds about this monument, the Lenin monument. How it happens that they are staying here in in Finland? Yeah, this will be interesting. <laughs> uh, the history of <coughs> this monument there. And one. I enjoyed all of the three papers very much. I learned a great deal of. Thank you so much. Uh, however, I have a question to Nikola Borovic. Um, how do you assess the uh, Ukrainian-German 
discourse of reconciliation, if there at all was any discourse of reconciliation in the 1990s and until the 1990s. And maybe is this a, a reason, the lack of this discourse, reason that we don't know really much about Russia and not, not even less about Ukraine, looking at the Polish-German discourse of reconciliation when we Germans le learn much, about, much more about Russia? Thank you, thank you, all, uh, all of you uh, for the very interesting papers. And I have a, a question for Mr. Reynolds. Um, for some years now, the Russian authorities uh, have been trying to requalify uh, the memorial site of Sandarmoch uh, in Karelia, where victims of the Greek terror are buried. Uh, by claiming that uh, it is a li at least uh, partly about uh, Soviet soldiers murdered by the Finns during the uh, Second World War. Uh, World War. Uh, do you know something about uh, the reactions these may have caused in uh, f f Finland? Uh, Maybe. Uh, thank you very much for this question. This is actually a great question. Uh, and it, it sounds strange <laughs> in this in this in this map, yeah, in this mental map for Germany, for example. Uh, first of all, yeah, but it was possible to to have such commissions and some reconciliation with with French, with with Russian, with with, with Paul, but not with Ukrainians. U Ukrainians didn't exist in, in, in this in mental, mental map. It, it wasn't any, any partner at, at all. And now we have a completely new situation. It, it, it is work which must be done. Just that's so. all. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the questions. So briefly on the Kotka issue is um, in the Finnish debate, it's a difficult question. I don't think I can fully answer why it's remained, but I can offer some ideas. Um, it's one of the largest Russian-speaking communities in Finland, um, and kind of there's an interesting history behind the actual monument that kind of layer this, that's been discussed in uh, newspaper articles. So first, when the statue was gifted, it was gift from Tallinn, uh, and it was created by an Estonian artist. Um, and kind of the commentary there is, is Lenin is missing his left hand in the picture. And so there's kind of the thought of, why is he missing his left hand? And the commentary has been that um, this was kind of a subtle um, civil disobedience by the Estonian artist to kind of show Lenin as impartial and kind of having some defects. And then um, building on this in the 1990s, a Polish artist actually added another statue to the park. So if you, the picture I showed, you saw Lenin with both hands and it's the picture looking at the statue from a certain angle. and it's the Polish artist made an addition of the left hand of Lenin, and it has a cigarette that's almost burnt out. And the idea is that it's symbolizing uh, the last cigarette before execution. So there's kind of these layers in this about kind of, you have the cult of Lenin and the way in which he um, arrived in uh, monument form throughout Finland and the Warsaw Pact, etc., in the Soviet Union. Um, and then kind of the subtleties of the adding layers of memory that aren't necessarily uh, written, but people kind of understand and kind of remember. So, but then also there's the other side is that the only Lenin Museum that still exists in the West, I believe, is in Tampere in Finland, and it's still open today. Um, so Finland has this long history as being kind of one of the uh, leading uh, centers for Euro-communism throughout the Cold War and kind of um, the, the Finnish Communist Party has a large history in this as well. And this kind of goes into the second question um, on Sandermo. So thanks, I'm, not also, I'm also not an expert on this, but um, it has been a big piece of the discussion. And for example, at the Finnish National Archive, they've run documentary projects to kind of offer oral histories of people who were uh, former Karelians who had to leave during the Second World War and kind of 
offer an alternative narrative. So there has been kind of a debate on this within popular history and then a debate in newspapers and official responses. Kind of um, the one other piece that comes up is this idea of throughout the Cold War there was also this piece of Finland reassessing, uh, retain, um, taking back Karelia, so kind of this greater Finland uh, idea. And this was seen in Petrozavodsk and taking this back during the Second World War. But kind of throughout the Cold War, this was always a issue, uh, issue of contention. And Finnish politicians made sure never to talk about this or kind of push it down in public debate, in, in elite discussions, etc. Um, so the memory politics that have arrived now, you can see kind of in St. Petersburg, they put up a, a, a plaque to uh, General Mannerheim, President Mannerheim of Finland, uh, because he, was, he taught in the Russian Empire, like a lot of the Estonian elite. Uh, but then that was protested immediately by a lot of the people in St. Petersburg because he's also a symbol of the um, blockade because Finnish troops were uh, important in that from the um, German and Finnish side. Um, so kind of, yeah, I don't know. This is also kind of the idea of how this is, Sondermo is also associated with this idea of Finland and Finland kind of with imperial ambitions, which the Finnish state doesn't necessarily want to admit. Um, and then kind of how they've been navigating this discussion. They want to offer an alternative story, but they also, at, you know, previously it was before February 24th, they didn't want, they were still in this mentality where they didn't want to upset this good Finnish-Russian relationship. So it'll be interesting to see if it continues and if it changes in the future. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe only a, a, a small remarks to, to uh, Bradley. Of course, um, this uh, Lenin in Kotka is uh, a present from, from Tallinn. And actually, uh, those uh, Lenins were uh, distributed to, to Eastern Bloc as well, but they are already removed from uh, public square. Um, in Estonia, it uh, already occurred uh, in the beginning of the 90s. All, all monuments dedicated to Soviet uh, leaders were removed. This was uh, also uh, in uh, uh, large cities uh, where uh, a Russian minority dominated. But now, uh, uh, I must say, uh, now it started um, a second wave of uh, uh, removal of uh, Soviet uh, monuments dedicated to the to Second World War and uh, heroes of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 Soviet actors, and uh, only uh, monuments in the cemeteries could remain. But our had to have to uh, remove this is intention, must say. Yeah, and just going off what Olev was saying, this would be very interesting because I've only, I'm only looking at the Finnish context to see how it occurred in other countries that also had uh, these memory politics in the early 1990s. Um, and kind of, if this is also based on security policies, the Finns always had the idea that, you know, they understood Russia, they, President Ninisto was the Putin whisperer, kind of, Finland didn't need to join NATO because they understood Russia so well. But then now, after February 24th, there was kind of like the questioning of this. And so then how that then reflects in a lot of the public debate is an interesting point too. But it seems like, you know, from what I've seen, Estonians kind of, uh, people in Poland have, kind of also asked, well, now you understand our way of seeing it, and it's kind of a, a, role, a role reversal. Yes, dimension is a very different. So there are estimated number of uh, war, Soviet war monuments is over uh, 300 in Estonia, still uh, existing. Are there any further questions, comments? Last call. If it's not the case, so we can. May, may I say Good. a couple of what in uh -huh. line in line? May, may I say a couple of what in line with this, with this question? No, and, 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 two, yes. uh, thank you. Uh, just the idea. Yeah, it, it, it would be it would be it would be not bad to have the German Ukrainian Institute in Kiev. For example, and uh, in Germany, more than a half of a share of history of Ukraine, uh, because of demand for, for the knowledge in, in, in Germany in, in this direction is, is enormous. 
And uh, there is a German-Ukrainian historical commission, but this commission was designed mm, to some extent to to bring the the, the real knowledge and then true 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 knowledge about history to the to the Ukraine, but not as a, as, a, as something like 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 this. What what was said, and um, yeah. I'm about the commission. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can <laughs> we may discuss discuss yes. it twice. I, I I think it's a, it's it's a very important observation because you know in in Germany not only in Germany um, the the planning the development of university of university was to a large to a large extent depending of ah. Uh, economic econo, econ, economic ideology so 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 um jak są kierunki no 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 to study so field of studies huh? not faculties institutes or kierunki studienfächer how are studienfächer called in in english Oborov studi, oborov, obory, studi nie obory. Subjects. Okay, you you know what I what I mean. And they they, they were closed or uh, uh, sometimes or professorships. No? Uh, uh, sometimes with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with with uh, with with the argument that uh, that there will no will no will be probably no be need for jobs in this. In this in this field of, of expertise, and what turned out now after the breakout of the war, outbreak of, <laughs> of the war, uh, that sometimes not the market is important, but the needs of the society. In Germany, everyone was surprised by the development in in in, in Ukraine. Uh, Military specialists, pol poli poli pol pol political science scientists, sociologists, and so on, and so on, because the, 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 the experts in Germany knew nothing, knew nothing about uh, uh, about Ukraine. There is there is a small group of historians. All the historians of Ukrainian history in Germany are autodidacts, only through their own personal specialization on the topics of Ukrainian history. There is no school, there is no, there is no field of specialization in, uh, uh, at the university. You, there is half professorship at, at Viadrina in the, in the whole, uh, whole, whole, uh, whole, whole, whole Germany. And that's the, that's the problem, that's the problem, because, um, because from the German perspective, Ukraine <laughs> Still was in the in the shadow of in the shadow of, of, of Russia. You can you can see that the argumentation of, of Chancellor Scholz. He 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 before the war already. He he always refused to do something because of our responsibility because we have attacked mm -hmm. Soviet Union means Russia. Yeah? He never he never had a glance on the map to see where the Wehrmacht <laughs> where the Wehrmacht campaign ca campaigns took took place in during the Second World War. You wanted to add something. Uh, a couple of words in line with my uh, so iconoclastic paper today. <laughs> but Ukraine, Ukraine can be, can be uh, important and interesting, not in, in, uh, in terms of the past for Germany, but, but maybe first of all in terms of the future. That's uh, uh, um, so, social development in Ukraine which Ukraine had in the last 30 years, can, can say something to Germany. We, we Germany must it, it, it develop itself in the in, in current world. Uh, but because, because this, this structure, this uh, uh, social structure, intellectual structure, uh, ideological structure, uh, they, they, they were built in Germany in this world which was created after the, 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 the Cold War. And this wor world exists exist no more. Yeah? And it, 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 it is a completely new world, and Germany isn't, is, isn't ready to this, to this world, I think. And maybe, I think, Ukraine can, can give some examples 
how to, to deal with, with this situation for Germany, and it, it, it can be stimulus, not, not only such, such uh, uh, social demand, but, but, but this, it can be very practical <laughs> to, to, to do something in this direction, to, to know more about this society in this country now. Thank you. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, so, uh, we have five o'clock, quite exactly, so we can close the section as scheduled in the program. The dinner will have place in the path, in the hotel path. Huh? P A V, <laughs> where you are, the, the, the most of, of you are accommodated. And it will start at half past five. Half past five. Yes. Not pub, but hotel. In the restaurant of the hotel. Pub. Pub. It's, what is the address of the hotel? <laughs> please, ta, please try, please try. <laughs> everyone, everyone coming from abroad will try now to read it. Ksemencova. Ksemencova. Ksemencova Street. It's not far from here. Thank you. Have a nice evening. <laughs>